Part 6 The Final Part of the Dungeon Master's Guide to the Curse of Strahd This video follows on from Part 5, where we learned of the Amber Temple and its dark secrets. In this portion of the guide, we'll be looking at Castle Ravenloft and the end of the Curse of Strahd campaign. Chapter 4 Castle Ravenloft Castle Ravenloft was built atop the ruin of an older fortress by artisans, wizards, and workers loyal to Strahd's family. Strahd rewarded the castle's genius architect, Artemis, with a crypt in the castle's catacomb. The castle was named after Strahd's mother, Ravnovia, who also lies entombed below. Random Encounters First time that the characters enter a castle area that isn't otherwise occupied, check for a random encounter. Also check for a random encounter every 10 minutes the characters spend resting in the castle. In most circumstances, a random encounter occurs on a roll of 18 or higher on a d20. To determine what the characters encounter, consult the tables below. The following are random encounters that may occur in Castle Ravenloft. Rolling a d12 plus a d8, add them together for the result of the encounter. Esmeralda de Avnir, Rahardin, One Black Cat, One Broom of Animated Attack, 1d4 plus 1 Flying Swords, A Blinsky Toy, An Unseen Servant, 1d4 Barovan Commoners, 2d6 Crawling Claws, 1d6 Shadows, 1d6 Swarm of Bats, 1 Crawling Strahd Zombie, 1d4 plus 1 Vistani Thugs, 1d4 Whites, a Trinket, a Giant Spider Cocoon, 1 Barovan Witch, 1d4 plus 1 Vampire Spawn, Strahd von Zarovich himself, the following are descriptions of the random encounters that you can use. Barovian Commoners A loud clamour fills the unhallowed halls of Ravenloft. Cries of, KILL THE VAMPIRE! are mixed with bold voices shouting, NEVER AGAIN! and TO THE CRIPS! Angry villagers who have entered the castle brandish torches and pitchforks in a ridiculous display of force. Everywhere they go, they shout for justice. They follow the characters unless prevented from doing so. As long as these Barovians are with the adventurers, random encounters occur on a roll of nine or higher. Barovian Witch You hear a woman's scratchy voice calling out her name. Gazzlegut! Gazzlegut! Where are you? A pox on you, you mangy cat! Through the darkness comes a crone wearing a pointed black hat and a burlap gown stained with soot. Characters can try to hide from the witch, who has dark vision, or catch her by surprise. This Barovian witch is one of the servants of Strahd dwelling in Area K-56. She is calling out the name of her black cat familiar, which has gone missing. If the characters confront her, the old bat spits at them and begins casting a spell. This encounter happens only once. If the result comes again, treat it as no encounter. Black Cat The darkness lets out a demonic hiss as the black cat darts out of the shadows, trying its best to avoid you. This familiar is searching for its mistress, a Barovian witch. It wants nothing to do with the characters, but it attacks if cornered. If the characters capture or kill the cat, this encounter doesn't occur again. If this result comes up again, treat it as no encounter. Blinsky Toy A Blinsky Toy is only encountered if the characters are moving about the castle and not resting. Otherwise, treat this result as no encounter. You find a discarded toy, something no child could love. The toy has a slogan stitched or printed in tiny letters. Is no fun, is no Blinsky. Roll a d6 to determine what specific toy it is. On a result of one, it's a plush werewolf stuffed with sawdust and tiny carved babies. It has dull knife blades for claws and retractable teeth. 
On a two, it's a smiling jester marionette with tangled strings and tiny copper bells sewn into its cap. On a three, it's a wooden puzzle box, six inches on a side, carved with silhouettes of leering clown faces. The box rattles when shaken. A character who spends a short rest fiddling with the box can figure out how to open it with a successful DC-20 intelligence check. The box is empty, with nothing inside to explain the rattling. On a result of four, the players find a faceless doll in a wedding dress that has yellowed and frayed with age. On a five, they find a vague coffin-shaped jack-in-the-box containing a pop-up Strahd puppet. On a six, they find a spring-loaded set of wooden teeth with fangs, all painted white. The teeth gnash and chatter for one minute when the spring is wound tight, requiring an action, and released. A broom of animated attack. You hear a scratching noise. Out of the shadow comes a broom, sweeping its way towards you as though held by invisible hands. When it gets within five feet of a party member, the broom attacks. Crawling claws. A mob of severed hands, their mummified flesh black with soot, skitter out of the darkness across the dusty floor. The crawling claws gang up on one party member. During the confusion, one of the claws tries to crawl into a character's backpack and hide there. It makes a dexterity stealth check contested by the character's passive wisdom perception score. If the claw loses the contest, the character sees the claw enter the backpack. If the claw wins the contest, it waits until the character takes a long rest before scuttling out to attack. A crawling Strahd zombie. You hear the deathly groans of something vile. The groans are coming from a Strahd zombie that is missing both of its legs, so that it only has its head, torso and arms remaining. It uses its arms to drag itself across the floor. The crawling zombie has 15 hit points remaining. If the characters are moving quietly and not using a light source, they can try to hide from the crawling zombie. Esmeralda Davnir. Esmeralda has cast a greater invisibility spell on herself and is stealthily exploring the castle. Choose one character at the back rank of the party's marching order and read the following text to the player character. You feel a gentle tap on your shoulder, but see nothing behind you. If the character who was touched by Esmeralda relax in an alarming or threatening manner, she hastily whispers, Don't be frightened, we're on the same side. Esmeralda is hunting Strahd, but her efforts to corner the vampire have so far been thwarted, and she fears that she might be in over her head. If the characters don't ask her to join the party, she wishes them well and goes on her way, perhaps to be encountered again later. If they invite her to accompany them, Esmeralda tests the character's knowledge about vampires, asking them questions such as, Have you ever seen a vampire change its form? And... Do you know how to counteract the vampire's regenerative ability? Whatever their answer, she ultimately agrees to come along. This random encounter happens only once. If the result comes up again, treat it as no encounter. Flying Swords Out of the gloom flies a rusty blade, followed by another. If more than two flying swords are encountered, the others aren't far behind. These weapons drift about the castle and attack intruders within range of their blind sight. Giant Spider Cocoon A giant spider cocoon is encountered only if the characters are moving about the castle, not resting, otherwise re-roll. A white cocoon is suspended from the ceiling amidst thick webs and appears to be holding something human-like. A giant spider made this cocoon. Characters who can reach it can cut it open to free whatever is inside. Roll a d6 to determine the cocoon's contents. On a result of 1, it's a wooden mannequin wearing a gown. On a result of 2, it's a Barovian witch. She screams like a wild animal and begins casting spells. On a result of 3, it's a Strahd zombie, and it fights until killed. On a 4, it's a Barovian lunatic, a chaotic neutral male commoner. If freed, he cackles until silenced or until a calm emotion spell is cast on him. A lesser restoration spell cures his madness, at which point he tries to flee the castle. On a result of five, it's a dead Barovian that serves as a host to a swarm of insects 
Spiders. The baby giant spiders, each one the size of a tarantula, crawl out of the Barovian's gaping mouth or burst forth from its distended belly. On a result of six, it's a Vistana bandit, a chaotic neutral male or female. The Vistana knows the castle layout and helps the characters until Strahd or more Vistani appear, at which point the treacherous Vistana turns on the characters. Rahadan. If Rahadan was killed or captured in a previous encounter, this encounter doesn't occur. Otherwise, Strahd's mysterious chamberlain approaches quietly. A character whose passive wisdom perception score meets or exceeds Rahadlan's dexterity stealth check, hear him. The master wishes to see you, intones a grim voice in the darkness. Rahadlan directs the characters to a random location in the castle, determined by rolling a d6. On a 1, they're directed to the chapel in area K15. On a 2, they're directed to the audience hall in area K25. On a 3, the study area K-37, on a 4, the tower roof, area K-57, on a 5, the wine cellar, area K-63, and on a 6, the torture chamber, area K-76. Strahd isn't actually at that location, unless the card reading, as described in the Fortunes of Ravenloft section, indicates that he is. If the characters ask Rahadan to lead the way, he declines. If the characters ask for direction, he tells them whether they need to ascend, descend, or remain on the level they're at. If they attack him, he fights to the death, otherwise he doesn't leave until after they do. Shadows If one or more characters have a passive perception of 16 or higher, read, You can't shake the feeling that something's behind you, but when you look back, you see a shadow, tall and still but nothing with such dimensions that could cast it. If more than one shadow is present, the others are close by, but hidden in the darkness. These undead shadows follow the characters, but do not attack unless attacked first. They otherwise obey Strahd's commands. Strahd von Zadovich. Strahd makes a surprise appearance. A crack of thunder shakes the castle, stirring the dust and cobwebs. You hear a voice. Good evening. Any character who has a passive wisdom perception score lower than 19 is surprised as Strahd appears seemingly out of nowhere. The vampire prefers to attack a surprise character, choosing the one closest to him. A swarm of bats. You hear a peal of thunder, followed by the flapping of tiny black wings. Suddenly, a dark cloud of bats descends upon you. These bats are servants of Strahd, they attack characters without provocation. Trinket. One random character finds a lost trinket. Read the following text to the player character. You kick something. A trinket buried in the dust. To determine what the character finds, roll on the trinket table as described in Appendix A. An unseen servant. A curious object drifts into view as though held aloft by an invisible force. This unseen servant was created by Strahd and is permanent until destroyed, but otherwise functions as a spell by the same name. Roll a d6 to determine what the servant is carrying, or choose one of the options below. On a result of one, it's carrying a tarnished silver platter with a lid worth 25 gold pieces. If a character comes within 5 feet of the servant, it lifts the lid, revealing a bunch of mouldy scones. The first character to eat a scone gains inspiration. On later occurrences of this encounter, the platter holds a crawling claw that attacks the nearest character. On a result of two, the servant is carrying a silver goblet worth 50 gold pieces, filled to the brim with wine. The character who drinks the wine must make a DC 15 constitution saving throw, taking 44 or 8d10 poison damage on a failed save, or half as much on a successful one. On future occurrences of this encounter, the wine acts as a potion of healing. On a result of three, the invisible servant is carrying a golden candelabrum worth 150 gold pieces, with three branches, each one holding an unlit candle. On a result of four, it is carrying a purple silk handkerchief with white ruffled edges, worth one gold piece. 
Upon future occurrences of this encounter, the handkerchief is smeared with fresh blood. On a result of five, it's carrying a crystal dinner bell worth 25 gold pieces. The unseen servant rings the bell if the characters come within 10 feet of it. The sound attracts 1d4 hungry vampire spawn, which arrive in 1d4 plus 1 rounds. On a result of 6, it's carrying a wizard spellbook with a blank velvet dust jacket over its stitched leather cover. The book contains all the spells that Strahd has prepared. On subsequent occurrences of this encounter, the tome is a non-magical leather-bound storybook worth 25 gold pieces. Vampire Spawn If any character has a passive wisdom perception score of 16 or higher, the party isn't surprised. In that case, read, Creatures with pale flesh scuttle across the ceiling like spiders, their red eyes glowing in the dark. As they draw near, their cracked and bloodstained lips open wide, revealing sharp fangs. These minions of Strahd, former adventures, all creep along the ceiling and drop down on unsuspecting prey. The vampire spawn fight until destroyed. The Vistani thugs. You hear voices with thick accents. A small group of Vistani, neutral evil male and female humans, claim that they were once the vampire's captives, only recently escaped from the castle's dungeon, and they offer to help the party. In truth, they are loyal to Strahd and betray the characters as soon as he appears. If the characters accept their offer, the thugs pretend to be the party's allies for as long as they remain with the party or until Strahd appears. If the character leaves the castle, the thugs accompany them since choosing to remain in the castle would likely arouse the character's suspicion. Treasure One Vistani thug carries a pouch that holds 2d8 small gemstones each worth 50 gold pieces. Whites. The air grows much colder. You can hear the march of footsteps drawing near. If the characters are moving quietly and not carrying light sources, they can try to hide from the whites. These undead soldiers once served as guard captains in Castle Ravenloft. They still wear bits of tattered livery and they attack the living on sight. Treasure. The Whites carry long swords that have the crest of Barovia worked into their crossguards. Each White also carries a pouch holding 2d20 Electrum pieces, each coin of Barovian mintage and featuring the profiled visage of Strad von Zarovich. The Walls of Ravenloft. This refers to Map 2 of the castle for areas K1 through to K6. Area K1, the front courtyard. As the characters enter the castle, the weather worsens. Dismal rain starts to fall, becoming a torrent within the hour. Lightning routinely lights the sky, followed by peals of thunder that make the castle shudder. A thick, cold fog swirls in this courtyard. Sporadic flashes of lightning lance the weeping clouds overhead as thunder shakes the ground. Through the drizzle, you see torch flames fluttering, on each side of the keep's main doors, warm light spills out of the entrance, flooding the courtyard. High above the entrance is a round window with shards of broken glass lodged in its iron frame. The walls that enclose the courtyard are 90 feet high. The dark towers of the castle rise even higher. Doors in the gate towers on each side of the tunnel entrance are shut against the rain and a howling wind rushes through the courtyard. The open main doors to the keep lead to area K7. The large shattered window overlooking the main entrance is 50 feet above the courtyard and leads to area K25. No light can be seen through the great window. Gate Towers Each outer gate has an iron-bound door with a built-in lock. Characters who enter the gate find themselves on a flagstone floor with a hollow tower stretching high above them. The mechanisms for raising and lowering the drawbridge and portcullis fill both gate towers. The latch mechanism in each tower is magically activated by a word only Strahd knows. It can be activated with a successful casting of Dispel Magic at a DC of 14. 
neither the drawbridge nor the portcullis will move until both latches are activated. Area K2, the center court gate. Two gates, one north of the keep and one to the south, prevent easy access from what lies beyond them. A massive wall juts out to connect the two outer walls of the castle with the keep. A 20 foot wide, 20 foot tall archway offers passage through the connecting wall, but is blocked by a rusting iron portcullis. The portcullis is unlocked and can be lifted with a successful DC 15 strength check. It can also be opened with the command word that only Strahd and Cyrus Bellevue from Area K-62 knows. Unless the portcullis is wedged or propped open, it falls back into place once it's let go. Area K-3, the servant's courtyard. This courtyard northeast of the keep is enclosed by towering walls. A stone carriage house with hinged wooden doors stands silent in the corner where the outer walls meet. Across from the carriage house, a slender wooden door reinforced with iron bands leads into the keep. The carriage house is described in area K4. The wooden door, which leads to area K23, is swollen and stuck in its frame. A character can shoulder open the stuck door with a successful DC-10 strength check. Area K4, the carriage house. Read the following text if the characters open the carriage house doors. The double doors swing open to reveal a sleek black carriage fitted with glass windows and brass lanterns. Area K5, Chapel Garden. At the back of the keep, behind the towering buttresses and tall boarded up stained glass windows, a small garden struggles to survive. Small flowers press skyward against the gloom. A pair of large iron gates blocks the way to some kind of overlook. The large iron gates squealed loudly on rusted hinges when opened. Beyond them lies Area K6. Area K6, the Overlook. Dark clouds overhead drizzle constantly. A flagstone avenue passes between empty outbuildings, leading to a stone-paved overlook. The Overlook has a low stone wall adorned with outward-facing gargoyle carvings. If a character peers over the balcony, read, A flash of lightning illuminates the dismal village of Barovia its rooftops visible above the smothering blanket of fog 1,000 feet below. If a character who has a passive wisdom perception score of 15 or higher peers over the wall, add, Underneath the platform on which you stand, about 100 feet down, a stone construction protrudes from the cliff face. Three dirt cake windows are set into it. The windows are so dirty as to be opaque, although a character within reach of one can scrape the dirt away and see a dusty tomb beyond area K88. Characters who try to reach the windows from the overlook must descend 110 feet and move 20 feet back under the platform. This descent can't be accomplished without the aid of magic or the use of a climber's kit. Anyone who falls from the overlook plummets 1,000 feet. Fortunes of Ravenloft if your card reading indicates an encounter with Strahd in this area, Executioner, the Jack of Spades, he is looking over the balcony. The Main Floor This refers to Map 3 of the castle, areas K7 through to areas K24. Area K7, the Entry Read through the following text if the characters have approached from the courtyard in area K1. The ornate outer doors of the castle hang open, flanked by fluttering torches in iron sconces. Twenty feet inside the castle is a second set of doors. If one or more characters approaches from area K1 and comes within ten feet of the double door, read, The doors in front of you suddenly swing open, revealing a grand hall filled with the sound of organ music. If the characters approach from area K8, and have not yet visited this area, read, A set of double doors to the west appears to be here, or to lead to, an exit from the castle. If the characters enter from either direction, read, Overhead in the vaulted entry foyer, four statues of dragons glare down, 
their eyes flickering in the torchlight. If anyone except Strahd enters this area through the doors that adjoin areas K-8, the dragons come alive, drop to the floor hissing and spitting, and attack. The dragons don't attack characters who enter this area from area K-1 heading east. The dragons are four red dragon wormlings, and they have instructions to allow guests to enter the castle, but not to leave it. If intruders vacate this area, the dragons fly up to their perches and revert to stone. In their stone form, they are impervious to weapon damage. The dragons never leave the room. Area K-8, the Great Entry Cobwebs stretch between the columns that support the vaulted ceiling of a great dusty hall dimly lit by sputtering torches in iron sconces. The torches cast odd shadows across the faces of eight stone gargoyles, squatting motionlessly on the rim of the dome ceiling. Cracked and faded ceiling frescoes are covered by decay. Double doors of bronze stand close to the east. To the north, a wide staircase climbs into darkness. A lit hallway to the south contains another set of bronze doors, through which you hear sad and majestic organ tones. The southern hallway is described in Area K-9. The wide staircase leads up to Area K-19. If the characters are here by invitation, add the following. An elf with brown skin and long black hair descends the wide staircase, quiet as a cat. He wears a grey cloak over black studded leather armour and has a polished scimitar hanging from his belt. My master is expecting you, he says. The elf is Rahadlan, the castle's chamberlain. He fights only if attacked, otherwise he leads the characters to the dining hall in area K-10. He points them inside and pulls the door shut behind them and withdraws to area K-72 by way of the south tower stair in area K-21. Development After all the characters leave this room, the eight gargoyles attack any character who dares return. The gargoyles also swoop down to fight if they are attacked. When the gargoyles attack, the turbulence in the air from their wings extinguish the feeble torches in the sconces, plunging the hall into darkness and lets the characters have light sources. Area K-9 The Guest Hall Torchlight flutters against the walls of this vaulted hall. To the east, an arched hallway stretches twenty feet, ending at a spiral staircase that goes up and down. Next to the hallway, a suit of armour, oiled and glistening, stands to attention in a shallow alcove. To the west, a large double door hangs slightly open, and a steady bright light escapes through the opening. Swells of organ music comes from behind the doors, spilling their melody of power and defeat into the hall. The suit of armour standing in the alcove is merely a normal suit of plate armour that is well cared for. The staircase leads to area K61 and up to area K30. The double doors provide access to area K10. Area K10, the dining hall. The first time the characters enter this room, read, Three enormous crystal chandeliers brilliantly illuminate this magnificent chamber. Pillars of stone stand against the dull white marble walls, supporting the ceiling. In the centre of the room, a long, heavy table is covered with white, fine satin cloth. The table is laden with many delectable foods. A roast beast basted in savoury sauce, roots and herbs of every taste, and sweet fruits and vegetables. Places are set for each of you with fine, delicate china and silver. At each place is a crystal goblet filled with an amber liquid with a delicate, tantalising fragrance. At the centre of the far west wall, between the floor-to-ceiling mirrors stands a massive organ. Its pipes blare out thunderous melody that speaks in a tone of greatness and despair. Seated at the organ, facing away from you, a single caped figure pounds the keys in raptured ecstasy. The figure suddenly stops as a deep silence falls over the dining hall and slowly turns towards you. The figure is an illusion of Strahd. It welcomes the characters and invites them to dine. The illusion acts like Strahd and plays the part of a gracious host, speaking kindly 
and telling the characters that they're free to explore the castle. Strahd might talk about his family, or shed light on the castle's history, but the illusion provides no useful information about the castle's inhabitants, treasure, or dangers other than to say that the castle doesn't receive many guests. The illusionary vampire converses with the characters, for no longer than three rounds, never moving from the organ bench. When the time is up, or if the illusion is attacked, it simply disappears with a mocking laugh. The moment the figure disappears, a fierce bone-chilling wind rises up and roars through the hall, putting out all open flames. The characters hear a screeching of ancient hinges and a solid thud of many heavy doors slamming shut, one after the other into the distance. They also hear the portcullis clang shut and the tired groan of the aged drawbridge pulling up. Finally, unless the doors to this room are being held open, they slam shut but do not lock. If the characters open the doors, they see that all the torches in area K7, K8 and K9 have gone out. The organ appears locked in place and immovable, but a character who makes a successful DC20 wisdom perception check notices scratch marks on the floor that suggest that the organ can be slid outwards. A character who tries pushing various keys and pedestals discovers that one of the pedals, when depressed, causes the organ to slide outward about two feet, allowing access to a secret door at the back wall that swings open to area K11. Because this secret door is hidden behind the organ, it can't be found and open until the organ is moved out of the way. The food on the table is tasty, the wine delicious. Area K11, the South Archer's Post. The castle courtyard is visible through arrow slits in the north and west walls. Leaning against the walls are mirrors of various sizes, some as tall as a human and others small enough to fit in a backpack. Each arrow slit is two and a half feet tall and four inches wide. The frame mirrors, 17 in all, used to hang on the various walls of the castle, Strahd had them taken down and stored here. A secret door in the east wall can be pulled open to reveal the back of a pipe organ in area K10. Characters can't pass through the secret door while the organ is blocking it, and the organ can't be moved from this side. Area K12, the turret post. A high dome ceiling caps a 30 foot wide octagonal room before you. Frescoes faded with age adorn the ceiling, but their images are impossible to make out. Tall, thin arrow slits look out over the courtyard. Each arrow slit is two and a half feet tall and four inches wide. Area K13, the turret post access hall. This long, narrow corridor runs east to west. Cobwebs fill the hall, obstructing sight beyond a few feet. Area K14, the Hall of Faith. This grand hall is choked with dust and stretches into the darkness ahead. Webs hang from the arched ceiling like drapes, and a life-size statue of knights line the hallway on both sides, their eyes seeming to watch you. The statues are harmless, their moving eyes are simply an optical illusion. Double doors stand at both ends of the hall. Above the doors leading to area K-15 hangs a symbol of beaten bronze that looks like a rising or setting sun. Area K-15, the chapel. Dim, coloured lights filter through tall, broken and boarded up windows of stained glass, illuminating the ancient chapel of Ravenloft. A few bats flutter about near the top of the 90-foot high dome ceiling. A balcony runs the length of the west wall. Fifty feet above the floor, in the centre of the balcony, two dark shapes are slumped in tall chairs. Benches coated with a century of dust lie about the floor in jumbled disarray. Beyond this debris, lit by a piercing shaft of light, an altar stands upon a stone platform. The sides of the altar are carved with bas reliefs of angelic figures intertwined with grapevines. The light from above falls directly on a silver statuette. A cloaked figure is draped over the altar and a black mace lies on the floor near its feet. The figure slumped on the altar 
is the remains of Gustav Herengast, a lawful evil human cleric who tried to obtain the Icon of Ravenloft and did not survive the attempt. A sculpted stone railing cordons off the upstairs balcony, which is described in Area K-28. Treasure The statuette on the altar is an artifact called the Icon of Ravenloft, as described in Appendix C. Any evil creature that touches the statuette must make a DC-17 constitution saving throw, taking 88 or 16 D10 radiant damage on a failed save, or half as much on a successful one. The statuette is safe for all creatures to handle once it is no longer in contact with the altar. Gustav's corpse wears a handsome fur-lined black coat embroidered with a golden thread, worth 250 gold pieces, and a suit of chainmail, both not magical. Gustav's mace is a mace of terror. Fortunes of Ravenloft If your card reading reveals that a treasure is here, the master of glyphs, the priest, it lies on the floor behind the altar. The Icon of Ravenloft A wondrous item, legendary, requires attunement by a creature of good alignment. The Icon of Ravenloft is a 12-inch tall statuette made of the purest silver weighing 10 pounds. It depicts a cleric kneeling in supplication. The icon was given to Strahd by the archpriest Cyril Romulich, an old family friend, to consecrate the castle and its chapel. While within 30 feet of the icon, a creature is under the effect of a protection from evil and good spell against fiends and undead. Only a creature attuned to the icon can use its other properties. Augury you can use an action to cast the Augury spell from the icon, with no material components required. Once used, this property can't be used again until the next dawn. Bane of the Undead You can use the icon as a holy symbol while using the Turn Undead or Turn the Unholy feature. If you do so, increase the save DC by 2. Cure Wounds While holding the icon, you can take an action to heal one creature you can see within 30 feet of you. The target regains 3d8 plus 3 hit points, unless it is undead, a construct, or a fiend. Once used, this property can't be used again until the next dawn. If your card reading indicates an encounter with Strahd in this area, the artifact or the first joker, he is among the bats fluttering below the ceiling, or he is standing at one end of the chapel a dark shape in the vast hall. Area K-16, the North Chapel Access. This arched room connects the vast chamber to the east and a staircase that rises to the west. Alcoves in the north and south wall hold eight foot tall sculptures of helmed knights with muscular builds. Black shadows fall across their faces. The statues are harmless. The vast chamber to the east is the chapel, area K-15. The staircase to the west is described in area K-29. Area K-17, the south chapel access. This arched room connects a vast chamber to the east and the landing of a staircase to the west. To the left of the landing, the stairs curl down into darkness. To the right, the stairs climb into thick drapes of cobwebs. Alcoves in the north and south walls hold eight-foot-tall sculptures of helmed knights with bright blades. Black shadows obscure their faces. The statues are harmless. The vast chamber to the east is the chapel, area K-15, and the staircase to the west is described in area K-18. Area K-18, the high tower staircase. The large flagstones of this spiralling staircase lead up and down around a 20-foot wide stone core. Cobwebs fill the staircase, making it difficult to see even the ceiling. Heavy beams sag overhead from centuries of supporting weight. The staircase starts at area K84 and spirals upwards around the central shaft to area K18A, climbing 300 feet to the top of the high tower in area K59. A recently constructed masonry wall blocks the staircase 10 feet below the landing west of Area K-17. A chink in this wall allows gas, or a vampire in gaseous form, to pass from one side of the wall to the other. A character who inspects the wall closely 
can spot the chink with a successful DC-10 wisdom perception check. The wall is too sturdy for characters to knock down, but they can create a hole wide enough to crawl through in one hour, or reduce the entire wall to a pile of masonry bricks and rubble in two hours. 30 feet below the masonry walls, and 50 feet above the foot of the steps, a small crack is formed in the outer wall of the stairwell. The small crack is half an inch wide, and 5 inches tall, and 12 inches deep. It leads to the castle's wine cellar, in area K63. Characters can notice the crack automatically as they climb or descend the stairs. Widening the crack enough to squeeze through the wall requires major excavation, and would take several days. The shaft that these stairs wrap around in area K18A runs vertically from area K59 to area K84 without any holes or obstructions. The inner wall of the stairwell between the staircase and the shaft is solid. Area K18A, the high tower shaft. Characters can access this 10 foot diameter, 390 foot tall stone shaft from the top or the bottom of the high tower in area K59 and K84 respectively. The shaft is dark and choked with cobwebs. A rushing wind causes the webs to stir. Climbing the shaft is impossible without the aid of magic or the use of a climber's kit, since there are so few handholds. The bats in the catacombs, area K84, fly up the shaft at night, exiting Castle Ravenloft through various arrow slits and holes in the tower's peak in area K59. After feeding, they return by the same route. Area K19, the Grand Landing. Massive stairs rise to a landing 20 feet by 40 feet long. Stone arches support a ceiling covered with frescoes 20 feet overhead. The frescoes depict armoured knights on horseback, their finer features faded beyond recognition. Dust floats in the air here. At each end of the south wall, a staircase rises into darkness. Between the staircases are twin alcoves, each one containing a standing suit of armour covered with dark stains. Each suit of armour clutches a mace, the business end of which is shaped like a dragon's head. Words engraved on the arches above the suits of armour have been scratched out. Both staircases on the south wall climb to area K25. The massive stairs lead down to area K8. Anyone who crosses in front of the alcoves along the south wall activates the suit of armour. Both suits of armour are mechanical traps, each one activated by a pressure plate hidden in the floor in front of its alcove. A character who searches for traps in one of these locations notices both pressure plates with a successful DC-15 wisdom perception check. When 40 or more pounds of weight are placed on the pressure plate, the suit of armour nearest to that plate springs forward, flailing its arms and wielding its mace. Any creature standing on a pressure plate when its trap was triggered must succeed on a DC-14 dexterity saving throw or take 7 2d6 bludgeoning damage from the flailing armour. After leaping out and attacking, the armour retracts. The pressure plate resets after one minute, after which its armour trap can be triggered again. The suits of armour act much like metal puppets, a little joke meant to spook visitors as opposed to damaging them. A pressure plate can be disabled by a character who uses thieves tools and makes a successful DC-15 dexterity check. A trap can also be disabled by destroying its suit of armour, which has an AC of 18, 5 hit points and immunity to psychic and poison damage. Area K20, the heart of sorrow. A mosaic floor adds a touch of colour to an otherwise dark, cold and empty tower that rises above you. A spiral staircase rises slowly into darkness, hugging the outer wall. In the centre of the room, another set of stairs leads down. The staircase in the centre of the floor of area K20A leads down to area K71. The spiral staircase has no railing and connects the main floor to the castle with each level above it. First, the staircase climbs 50 feet to a landing, shown on map 4, from which an opening archway leads to area K13. 
East of that opening is a secret door that conceals a ladder leading down to area K-34. The stairs ascend another 40 feet to another landing, as shown on map 5, with archways that lead to areas K-45 and K-46, and then climb another 100 feet to a landing beneath the tower's heart, as shown on map 8. The staircase wraps around the heart, ending at the top of the tower in area K-60. The heart. The tower, including the spiral staircase, is alive. When the characters set foot on the staircase for the first time, read, As you step onto the spiral staircase, a reddish light flares overhead, then settles into a dull, pulsing red glow. You now see the full immensity of this tower. The spiral staircase circles up the tower's full height. The tower, 60 feet wide at its base, becomes narrower as it climbs. At the pinnacle of the hollow tower, a large crystal heart pulses with the red light. Above the heart, the stairs continue upward. Have the characters and the Heart of Sorrow roll initiative. If the characters leave the tower and later return, they can re-roll initiative, but the heart's initiative count doesn't change. The awakened tower shakes and pitches on the Heart of Sorrow's initiative count. Any creature on the stairs or hanging on the tower wall at the start of the heart's turn must succeed on a DC 10 dexterity saving throw or fall to the base of the tower. Characters who are crawling on the staircase or who lie prone on the stairs succeed automatically. The Heart of Sorrow is a 10 foot diameter red crystal heart that floats near the top of the tower. Characters standing on or nearby the stairs can make melee attacks against the heart, provided their weapons have a reach of at least 10 feet. The glass heart has an AC of 15 and 50 hit points. If the heart is reduced to zero hit points, it shatters and its crystal shards transform into blood, which rain down the tower's interior and staircase. The destruction of the Heart of Sorrow causes the tower to stop shuddering, and the interior of the tower becomes dark. Destroying the heart earns the characters 1,500 experience. Strahd and the Heart of Sorrow are connected, such that any damage Strahd takes is transferred to the heart. If the heart absorbs damage and drops to zero hit points, it is destroyed, and Strahd takes any leftover damage. The Heart of Sorrow regains all its hit points at dawn if it has at least one hit point remaining. The Heart of Sorrow is held aloft by the will of Strahd. Casting Dispel Magic on it has no effect. Animated Halberds Mounted on the walls along the section of the staircase nearest the heart are ten animated halberds. Use the stat block for the flying sword in the monster manual, but increase each halberd's damage to 1d10 plus 1 and reduce its AC to 15. The halberds attack any creature that threatens the heart of sorrow. Vampire Spawn Stride senses if any damage is done to the Heart of Sorrow and sends four Vampire Spawn to destroy those responsible. These Vampire Spawn are former adventurers whom Strahd defeated a long time ago. They use their spider climb feature to scuttle along the tower wall and arrive in three rounds. Area K-20A, the Tower Hall Stair. This stairway connects areas K-20 and K-71. Area K-21, the South Tower Stair. Fluttering torches in iron sconces illuminate this spiral staircase. A chill wind rushes down the circling stairway, seeming to kill the very heat of the torches. These stairs start at area K-73 and go up through areas K-61, K-9, K-30 and K-35 before ending at area K-47. Area K-22 the North Arches Post. The castle courtyard is visible through arrow slits in the walls. Each arrow slit is two and a half feet tall and four inches wide. Area K-23, the servant's entrance. A dim light filters through a dust cake window in the east wall. A door next to the window leads to the castle's northeast courtyard. Everything in this room is coated with dust including a large heavy table in the centre of the floor. 
A thick book lies open on a desk, an inkwell and a quill next to it. There is a broken door in the north wall, and a staircase in the south wall plunges into darkness. On each side of the staircase, a skeletal figure draped in gleaming chainmail stands sagging at attention, holding a rusty halberd. The skeletons, which are assembled by Cyrus Bellevue from Area K-62, are held together with wireframes and hung on pegs. They pose no threat. The staircase descends to Area K-62. The east door leading to the courtyard is swollen in its frame and requires a successful DC-10 strength check to force open. The north door is cracked and hangs loose on its hinges. Beyond it lies another dust-filled chamber of Area K-24. The ancient book is weathered and brittle, but the ink in the well is fresh. At the top of each page is scribed the message, Please register for your own convenience and for that of your next of kin. The book is more than half filled with names, all of them illegible. Area K-24, The Servants' Quarters Broken furniture and torn cloth are strewn about this 20 by 40 foot room. Dim light comes from a pair of dirt cake windows in the northeast corner. A narrow staircase with no railing ascends along the north path. The stairs lead to area K-34. Court of the Count Refer to map 4 of the castle for areas K-25 through to K-34. Area K-25 the audience hall. Dim light from the courtyard falls into this great hall through the broken glass and iron latticework of a large window in the west wall. This immense room is a place of chilly brooding darkness. Empty iron sconces dot the walls. Hundreds of dust-laden cobwebs drape the hall, hiding the ceiling from view. Directly across from the window stands a set of double doors in the east wall. Farther south, a single door also leads from the east wall. Staircases at both ends of the north wall lead down. At the far southern end of the hall, a large wooden throne stands atop a marble dais. The high back throne faces south, away from most of the room. A secret door in the south wall leads to area K-13. It is hidden by dust and cobwebs and requires a successful DC-16 perception wisdom check to find. Both staircases in the north wall lead down to area K-19. The eastern double doors can be pulled open to reveal area K-26 beyond. The single door in the east wall opens to area K-30. Fortunes of Ravenloft If your card reading reveals that a treasure is here, the Eight of Swords, the Dictator, it's found on the marble dais just behind the throne. If your card reading indicates an encounter with Strahd in this area, the Beast or the Jack of Diamonds, he is sitting on the wooden throne. Area K-26, the guard post. If the characters enter this hall through either set of double doors, read, the doors open to reveal another set of double doors 10 feet ahead. Between these doors, a 10-foot wide corridor stretches north to south. At each end of the hall, floating in darkness, is a human skeleton clad in rusted armor and tattered livery of a castle guard. The floating skeletons hang from pegs on the north and south walls. The skeletons, which were assembled by Cyrus Bellevue from Area K-62, are held together with wire and are harmless. Behind the skeleton on the north wall is a secret door that can be pushed open into area K-33. If the characters enter the hall by the way of the secret door that adjoins area K-33, they see a skeleton hanging on the inside of the secret door as soon as they pull it open, and with a light source or dark vision, they can see the skeleton on the south end of the hall as well. Area K-27, The King's Hall this 20-foot high hall has a dark vaulted ceiling, draped with cobwebs. A low moan seems to travel the length of the corridor as it rises and falls, intoning sadness and despair. The moaning is only the wind. Characters who examine the ceiling can, with a successful DC-20 wisdom perception check, 
spot pulleys and a rope that run the full length of the corridor along the ceiling, well hidden by the cobwebs. These items are soon to be explained in The Flight of the Vampire. Halfway down the hall on the south side is a narrow secret door that can be pulled open to reveal Area K-31. Flight of the Vampire Hidden in a compartment above the western set of double doors is dressed a wooden mannequin that looks exactly like Strahd. It wears a black cloak, its fangs are bared, and its arms and clawed fingers are outstretched in a threatening manner. The mannequin is attached to a rope that runs through pulleys fastened along the length of the hallway ceiling. When one or more characters reach the midpoint of the hall from either direction, read, you hear a scraping sound of stone against stone, followed by the squeaking of a bat. In the direction of the noise, you see the fanged visage, outstretched claws, and flapping black cape of a vampire bearing down on you from above. A deep throaty chuckle fills the air. The scraping noise is the sound of the hidden compartment opening, and the squeaking is the sound of the pulleys supporting the weight of the mannequin as it glides through the air. The chuckling is a harmless magical effect, similar to that created by the prestidigitation cantrip. Have the players roll initiative and run this as a combat encounter with the vampire acting on initiative count 5. On its turn, the mannequin flies over the characters, 10 feet above the floor, and doesn't stop until it reaches the east end of the hall. On its next turn, it reverses direction and flies back to its compartment. The trap resets after one minute. A character who attacks the mannequin from the floor needs to have a range of at least 10 feet. The mannequin has AC 15, and 10 hit points, and it is immune to poison and psychic damage. If the mannequin is reduced to zero hit points while in the air, it falls to the floor. Area K-28, the King's Balcony. A sculpted stone railing encloses this long balcony, which overlooks Ravenloft's chapel. Two ornate thrones stand side by side in the center of the balcony, covered with dust and strung with cobwebs. The throne faces away from the double doors that give access to the balcony. Two Strahd zombies are slouched on the thrones. They remain motionless until one of them is disturbed, or another creature comes within the zombies' reach, whereupon they attack. The balcony is 50 feet above the floor of the chapel in area K-15. A staircase north of the double doors leads down to area K-29. Area K-29 the creaky landing. This staircase is made of old wood that strains underfoot, creaking and groaning. The staircase climbs from area K16 to area K28. It seems unstable, but is sturdy. The creatures in area K28 can't be surprised by anyone climbing the creaky steps. Area K30, the king's accountant. Dusty scrolls and tomes line the wall of this room. More scrolls and books lie scattered on the floor, around four heavy wooden chests fitted with iron locks. The only unobstructed floor space is directly in front of the doors to the east and west halls. In the center of this clutter stands a great black desk. A figure crouches atop a tall stool, scratching on a seemingly endless scroll of paper with a dry quill pen. Nearby, a tasseled rope hangs from a hole in the ceiling. The figure is Leif Lepsiege, a chaotic evil male human commoner, an accountant. He is chained to the heavy wooden desk and has no interest in the characters or their concerns. Under no circumstances does he voluntarily leave the room. Leif pulls the rope the instant he feels threatened. Pulling the rope requires an action. When the rope is pulled, a tremendously loud gong sounds. One or more creatures arrive 1d6 rounds later attacking any characters still in the room. Determine the creatures randomly by rolling a d4. On a result of 1, 1d6 shadows arrive. On a result of 2, 1d4 vampire spawn arrive. On a result of 3, 1d4 whites arrive. On a result of 4, 1 wraith and 1d4 plus 1 spectres arrive. Leaf was pressed into service by Strahd many years ago. He keeps all the books for Strahd, recording the vampire's riches and conquests. Leaf has been here longer than he can remember. 
He is grumpy because Strahd doesn't allow him to know about all his treasures. Even so, Leif has found out where one of Strahd's secret treasures lies. If he is treated with kindness, Leif will divulge the hiding place of the holy symbol of Ravenkind, as indicated by your card reading. Leif can draw a crude map showing a route to the location, but he admits that he doesn't acknowledge or avoid any dangers that might lie along the way. Leif doesn't necessarily know the most direct path to the symbol's location. Leif knows that there's a key that unlocks all four chests, but he can't remember where he hid it. The western door leads to area K25. The eastern door provides access to the staircase, area K21, that leads down to area K9, and up to a landing outside area K35, continuing upward from there to area K47. Treasure. The room contains hundreds of worthless books and scrolls describing accounting procedures. The first character who spends at least 10 minutes searching the room and succeeding on a DC-15 intelligence investigation check, finds a book with a bloodstained leather cover. The pages of this book have been hollowed out, creating a hole in which Leaf has hidden the iron key that unlocks the four wooden chests in the room. Two of the chests contain 10,000 copper pieces each. A third chest contains 1,000 gold pieces. The fourth chest holds 500 platinum pieces, hidden under which is a manual of bodily health. Area K31, the trap works. The aromas of grease and well-oiled wood hit your nostrils as you open up the door. This 10 by 20 foot room is filled with intricate machinery, except for small spaces between the stone gears and the iron chains and pulleys. On the other side of the machinery, to the south, is a rectangular shaft that rises up from the darkness and continues past this room. Attached to the west wall is a steel plate that has an iron lever protruding downwards. The shaft, area K31A, descends 90 feet from here to area K61, and ascends 40 feet to area K31B. Another 40 feet above that is a stone trap door in a ceiling that opens to area K47. Operating the machinery in this room, raises a stone elevator compartment from the bottom of the shaft, lifting it past this room to the top of the shaft. See area K61 for more information on the elevator trap. A character can spend one minute disabling the machinery in this room. The elevator trap won't function until the machinery is repaired. The iron lever set into the western wall is normally in the down position. Moving it to the up position activates the trap and raises the elevator. Sliding it back down lowers the elevator and resets the trap. When the elevator trap in area K61 is activated, all the chains and pulleys and gears in this room move at once. It takes 10 seconds or one round for the elevator to reach the top of the elevator shaft. The machinery doesn't stop until the elevator completes its journey. A secret door in the north wall is easy to spot from this side, with no ability check required and opens into Area K27. Area K31A, the elevator shaft. Cold air fills this rectangular shaft, the walls of which are coated with mildew and worn smooth. Taut iron chains extend up and down the shaft. The links of the chains are thick with grease. The shaft is 170 feet tall. It starts in Area K61, climbs 90 feet to Area K31, another 40 feet to area K31B, and another 40 feet to area K47. When the elevator trap is activated, as described in area K61, a stone elevator compartment measuring 10 feet on a side rises up the western half of the shaft. At the same time, a solid block of stone, also 10 feet on a side, descends in the eastern half of the shaft, acting as a counterweight. Both stone blocks have thick iron chains bolted to them, by which they are hoisted and lowered as needed. Scaling the shaft is impossible without the aid of magic or the use of a climber's kit, because the walls are smooth and slick with mildew, and greasy iron chains are too thick and slippery to grasp. Set into the roof of the shaft is a five-foot square stone trap door that can be pushed open to reveal Area K47. Area K31B 
the shaft access. This 10 foot square room overlooks a vertical shaft to the south that plunges into darkness and continues upwards. This vantage point is 130 feet from the bottom of the shaft in area K31A. 40 feet down is area K31, and 40 feet up is a stone trap door in the ceiling that opens into area K47. A door in the north wall is easy to spot from this side, with no ability check required, and opens into area K39. Area K32, made in hell. Oil lamps illuminate this long rectangular chamber with oak panelled walls. Stained yellowed lace hangs neatly from eight canopied beds. A figure of a woman moves lightly about the room, dusting furniture and humming quietly. Around her pale slender neck is a gold necklace with a ruby pendant. The maid, Helga Ruvak, is a vampire spawn who claims to be the daughter of the village bootmaker. Kidnapped and forced into service by Strahd, she pleads on her hands and knees if necessary to be saved from this awful place. Helga will join the party if the characters allow. She intends to attack the characters, but doesn't do so until she senses an opportunity that doesn't involve having to fight the entire party. She also attacks if commanded to do so by Strahd. Helga plays the part of the innocent damsel in distress to the last, revealing her ferocity only when she attacks. She is, in fact, the bootmaker's daughter as she claims to be, but she chose a life of evil with Strahd. Treasure. Helga's gold necklace with its ruby pendant is a gift from Strahd. The necklace is almost five centuries old and is worth 750 gold pieces. Area K33. The King's Apartment Stair. This dark hall is concealed behind two secret doors. This arched corridor has been swept clean. Oak panelling decorates the walls to a height of four feet. Mounted on the east wall above the wood panelling, are three unlit oil lamps spaced ten feet apart. A plain wooden door is set into the west wall, and light sweeps through its cracks. A staircase to the north end of the west wall ascends into darkness. The staircase climbs 40 feet to area K45. The door in the west wall opens to area K32. Area K34. The servant's upper floor. Dirt cake windows allow little light to enter this upstairs room. Broken bed frames and torn bits of mattress litter the floor. A tall dusty wardrobe, roughly the shape of a coffin, its black wooden doors painted with fake creatures, stands between two cracked full-length mirrors that hang on the south wall. A staircase descends along the north wall. If someone opens the wardrobe, read... A plain white dress, yellowed with age, flies out of the wardrobe and begins to dance in the middle of the room. The dress flaps around to the music of the storm. If anyone touches the dancing dress, it collapses in a lifeless heap on the floor. Otherwise, it dances forever. Hanging in the wardrobe are a few rotten servants' uniforms, none of which are animate or valuable. Set into the south wall, behind the hanging mirror, west of the wardrobe, is a secret door. It can be pulled open to reveal a closet choked with dust and cobwebs, and it contains a wooden ladder that leads up 20 feet to another secret door in the tower stairway of area K20. The staircase leads down to area K24. The Rooms of Weeping Refer to map 5 of the castle for areas K35 through to K46. Area K35 the Guardian Vermin. A door of delicately engraved steel stands at the west end of this short, dark hallway. Intricate details stand clearly on the door's surface. The door seems to shine with a light of its own, untouched by time. Flanking the doors are two alcoves in shadow. A dark, vaguely man-shaped figure stands in each alcove. The dark figures are four swarms of rats, piled atop one another to form man-like shapes with two swarms per alcove. These rats are under Strahd's control and attack anyone that tries to move through this area. The steel door is engraved with the images of a human king in armor astride a horse, a majestic range of mountains and shooting stars in the background. Tiny figures of people and wolves frame the image. 
Area K-36, the dining hall of the Count. Dust assaults your lungs. A sweet yet pungent smell of decay fills this room, in the centre of which stands a long oak table. A blanket of dust covers the tabletop and its fine china and silverware. In the centre of the table, a large tiered cake leans heavily to one side. The once white frosting has turned green with age. Cobwebs hang like dusty lace down every side of the cake. A single dull figure of a well-dressed woman adorns the crest of the cake. Suspended above is a web-shrouded chandelier of forged iron. An arched window in the south wall is draped with heavy curtains. Resting in a wooden stand by the window is a dusty lute, and standing quietly in the southwest corner is a tall harp shrouded in cobwebs. The wedding cake is over four centuries old, kept in its current rotting state by the will of Strad. The toy figure of the groom from the top of the cake was cast on the floor long ago. A character who searches the dusty floor finds the figure with a successful DC-10 wisdom perception check. If the characters take the groom figure out of the room, read the following if they return to the room at a later time. Billowing drapes draw your eye to the window, which have been broken outward. Scattered about the floor are chunks of the mouldy cake, as if something had burst out of it. There are two explanations for the burst cake and the broken window. Choose the one you think is creepier. Strad smashes the cake and breaks the window to make the characters think something terrible has escaped and now is stalking them. Strad's hate assumes corporeal form and bursts out of the cake, the symbol of Sergei and Tatiana's love, and escapes through the window. Strad's hate has the statistics of an invisible stalker and tries to kill whichever character is carrying the groom figure. The room has wooden doors in the north and west walls and an ornate steel door in the east wall as described in area K-35. The harp stands six and a half feet tall and weighs close to 300 pounds. It is fashioned of dark stained wood carved with images of hearts and roses. Its torch strings are made of gut. A character who plays the harp and succeeds on a DC-15 charisma performance check does well enough to summon the ghost of Piddlewick, a short little man dressed as a fool with a tiny jingling bell at the end of his pointy dunce cap. He asks, Why have you summoned me from beyond the grave? Regardless of the answer, he commends the characters for playing well, and says, In my crib below the castle, thou shalt find a treasure worthy of one so talented as thee. May it help thee set this troubled place to rest. If the characters think to ask who he is, the fool replies, Piddlewick. And if asked how he died, he replies humorously, I fell down the stairs. If Piddlewick II, as described in Area K-59, is with the party, the ghost points at the clockwork effigy and says, He pushed me down the stairs. With nothing more to add, the ghost of Piddlewick fades away and doesn't appear again. If the characters attack the ghost, it returns them in turn treasure. The loot, though old and covered in dust, has survived the passage of time. It is a magic instrument of the bards called a dos loot. Area K-37 The Study A blazing hearth fire fills the room with rolling waves of red and amber light. The walls are lined with ancient books and tomes, their leather covers well oiled and preserved through careful use. All is in order here. The stone floor is concealed beneath a thick, luxurious rug. In the center of the room is a large, low table, waxed and polished to a mirror finish. Even the poker in its stand next to the blazing fireplace is polished. Large, overstuffed divans and couches are arranged about the room. Two chairs of burgundy-colored wood with padded leather seats and back cushions face the hearth. A huge painting hangs on the mantelpiece in a heavy gilded frame. The rolling firelight illuminates the carefully rendered portrait. It is an exact likeness of Irina Koliana. This chamber has several exits, including a large set of double doors in the west wall, a door at each end of the north hall, and a door to the south. The paintings above the fireplace depict Tatiana, a beautiful young woman with auburn hair. 
Strad commissioned the painting over four centuries ago to impress his beloved. The fact that Irina Kolyana looks exactly like Tatiana is proof to Strad that both women were born with the same soul. The back wall of the fireplace contains a secret door, which is opened by lifting the poker from its stand. The fire must be extinguished in order for anyone to reach the secret door safely. Otherwise, a creature that enters the fireplace for the first time on a turn, or starts its turn there, takes 5 or 1d10 fire damage and catches fire. Until someone takes an action to douse the flames on the creature, it takes 5 or 1d10 fire damage at the start of each of its turns. This fire damage is cumulative with the damage from standing in the fireplace. The secret door provides access to Area K-38. Treasure The real treasure here is Strahd's collection of books. Over 1,000 unique tomes in all, the collection is worth 80,000 gold pieces. Transporting it would be a challenge. Roll a d12 and consult the following table to determine the subject matter of a randomly chosen book. On a 1, the players find an alchemist tome. On a 2, a beastery of strange beasts. On a 3, they find a biography of a forgotten king or queen. On a 4, they find a book of exotic recipes. On a 5, they find a book of heraldry. On a 6, they find a book of military strategy. On a 7, an epic novel. On an 8, a guide to fine wines. On a 9, a heretical text. On a 10, a historical text. On an 11, a poetry anthology. And on a 12, a theological text. Teleport Destination Characters who teleport to this location from Area K-78 arrive in front of the painting of Tatiana. Fortunes of Ravenloft If your card reading reveals that a treasure is here, the Eight of Stars, the Necromancer, it is resting on the mantelpiece under the portrait of Tatiana. If your card reading indicates an encounter with Strahd in this area, the Eight of Stars, the Necromancer, he is sitting back in one of the overstuffed chairs, staring into the fire. Area K-38, the False Treasury. Resting on the floor of this smoke-filled room is a closed chest surrounded by piles of gold, silver, and copper coins. The fittings and clawed feet of the chest are evidence of great workmanship. Attached to the east wall are two torch sconces. The southernmost one holds a torch with an intricate metal base. The other is empty. A skeleton in broken plate armor lies against the wall. The skeleton's right hand is on its throat, and its left hand holds a matching torch from the empty sconce. The coins scattered around the trap chest total 50 gold pieces, a hundred silver pieces, and two thousand copper pieces. The chest weighs forty pounds and is unlocked. When opened, it releases a cloud of sleeping gas that fills the room. Any creature in the room must succeed in a DC-18 constitution saving throw, or be paralyzed for four hours. If all the characters succumb to the gas, they are found by the witches who lair in Area K-56 and dragged into Area K-50, then left there unharmed. Even if one character resists the effect of the gas, the witches do not appear. The armored skeleton on the floor is all that remains of an adventurer. His corpse has nothing of value. Secret Doors This room is concealed behind two secret doors. The secret door to the west is set into the back of the fireplace of Area K-37 and can be pulled open within this room by lifting a simple locking mechanism which is connected to the poker in the study. It's possible that a character might open the secret door inadvertently by lifting the poker in Area K-37. Characters can otherwise locate the secret door normally, but a successful check doesn't reveal the mechanism to open it. That can be found only through trial and error. Or, the characters can bypass the mechanism with a knock spell or similar magic. The secret door at the northern end of the east wall is sealed shut. If the torch is taken from the skeleton's hands, and placed back in the empty sconce, the secret door swings inward, revealing Area K-39 beyond. Removing the torch from its sconce at any time causes the secret door to close and lock shut, becoming sealed as before. Characters can locate this secret door manually, but a successful check doesn't reveal the mechanism to open it. That can be found only through trial and error, 
or the characters can bypass the mechanism with a knock spell or similar magic. Area K39, the Hall of Webs. This ancient hall is choked with spider webs, broken by a single clear path down its center. The hall has an arched ceiling 20 feet overhead, hidden behind thick webbing. At the eastern end are a pair of arched bronze doors of ornate design. These doors can be pulled open to reveal area K40 beyond. Most of the hall is full of giant spider webs, as described in the Dungeon Hazards section of the Dungeon Master's Guide. Characters who stray from the unobstructed path through the web risk becoming stuck. Webs, a hazard from the Dungeon Master's Guide. Giant spiders weave thick, sickly webs across passages and at the bottom of pits to snare prey. These web-filled areas are difficult to rain. Moreover, a creature entering a webbed area for the first time on a turn, or starting its turn there, must succeed on a DC-12 dexterity saving throw, or become restrained by the webs. A restrained creature can use its action to try to escape, doing so with a successful DC-12 strength athletics check, or dexterity acrobatics check. Each 10-foot cube of giant webs has an AC of 10, 15 hit points, and vulnerability to fire, as well as immunity to bludgeoning, piercing, and psychic damage. Secret Doors At the west end of the hall are two secret doors. The secret door on the west wall can't be opened from this side, except by magic, such as the knock spell. See area K38 for more information on this secret door. If the characters pass through this door coming from area K38, it closes and locks behind them if they don't take measures to prop it open. A narrow secret door at the western end of the south wall is hidden behind a mass of webs. If these webs are cleared away, characters can search for a secret door, finding it with a successful DC 15 wisdom perception check. The door can be pulled open to reveal area K31B. Area K40, the Belfry. You can hear the rain and thunder outside and the air here is cold and damp. Veils and curtains of webbing fill the room, making it hard to gauge its width and depth. A single narrow path leads to the dark center of the room, where a rope dangles from high above. The rope is attached to a great bell mounted in a wooden framework 50 feet overhead. Pulling the rope, or attempting to climb it, brings forth a loud, long, That sound causes five giant spiders to drop from their webs and attack. The spiders attack only if they are attacked, or if the bell is sounded. Most of the belfry is filled with giant spider webs. Characters who blunder into them risk becoming stuck. At the west end of the north wall, behind thick webs, is a secret door that opens into Area K-41. Area K-41, the treasury. This octagonal vault is free of dust and cobwebs. The dome ceiling 40 feet above is painted black and sparkles with a display of stars in an unfamiliar constellation. Barely contained within this vault is a square tower, 20 feet on a side and 30 feet high, with arrow slits on all sides and a battlemented roof. The dome ceiling is coated with dry pitch, the stars are shards of glowing crystal embedded in the pitch, each one as bright as a candle flame. Thanks to the starry night, the vault is dimly lit. The plundered riches of Strahd's secret hoard lie within this adamantine tower, which is actually a Dayern's instant fortress. Only Strahd knows the command word to alter its shape and size, which can't be done until every bit of treasure inside it is removed. Only Strahd can open the two means of entry, a sealed adamantine door set into the base of the tower on the north side, and an adamantine trap door on the roof. The arrow slits of the tower are four inches wide, two feet tall, and the walls of the fortress are three inches thick. Characters who are able to reduce their size or assume gaseous form can enter the tower through these slits. Dayan's Instant Fortress a wondrous item, rare. You can use an action to place this one inch metal cube on the ground and speak its command word. The cube rapidly grows into a fortress that remains until you use an action to speak the command word that dismisses it. 
which only works if the fortress is empty. The fortress is a square tower, 20 feet on a side and 30 feet high, with arrow slits on all sides and a battlement atop it. Its interior is divided into two floors, with a ladder running along one wall to connect them. The ladder ends at a trap door leading to the roof. When activated, the tower has a small door on the side facing you. The door opens only at your command, which you can speak as a bonus action. It is immune to the knock spell and similar effects, such as that of the chime of opening. Each creature in the area where the fortress appears must make a DC 15 dexterity saving throw, taking 10d10 bludgeoning damage on a failed save, or half as much on a successful one. In either case, the creature is pushed to an unoccupied space, outside but next to the fortress. Objects in the area that aren't being worn or carried take this damage and are pushed automatically. The tower is made of adamantine, and its magic prevents it from being tipped over. The roof, the door, and the walls each have 100 hit points, immunity to damage from non-magical weapons excluding siege weapons, and resistance to all other damage. Only a wish spell can repair the fortress. This use of the spell counts as replicating a spell of 8th level or lower. Each casting of wish causes the roof, the door, or one wall to regain 50 hit points. Treasure the ground floor of Dayern's instant fortress contains 50,000 copper pieces, 10,000 silver pieces, 10,000 gold pieces, 1,000 platinum pieces, 15 assorted gems worth 100 gold pieces each, and a plus 2 shield emblazoned with a stylized silver dragon that is the emblem of the Order of the Silver Dragon as described in Chapter 7. The shield whispers warning to its bearer granting it a plus two to initiative if the bearer is incapacitated. The upper floor of the tower contains 10 pieces of jewelry worth 250 gold pieces each in a red velvet sack, an alchemy jug, a helm of brilliance, a plus one rod of the pack keeper, and an unlocked wooden coffer with four compartments, each one containing a potion of greater healing. Fortunes of Ravenloft if your card reading reveals that a treasure is here, the Nine of Coins, the Miser, it is lying atop the coins on the ground floor inside the tower. If your card reading indicates an encounter with Strahd in this area, the Tempter, the Queen of Diamonds, he is perched atop the tower. Area K42, the King's Bedchamber. Sweet smells waft from this delicately lit room. A great arch window along the west wall is covered by heavy red draperies, their golden tassels glinting in the light of the three candelabras sitting atop small tables about the room. Tall white candles burn with bright steady light. A large bed, canopied by silk curtains, sits with its headboard against the north wall. Carved into the headboard, with great skill, is a large Z. Lying amid the velvet and satin sheets and bedcloths, is a young woman in a nightgown. One of her dainty slippers has fallen to the floor at the bed's foot. Arch double doors lead from this room to the south and east. The window is divided into four tall panes of glass, each enclosed by a lead framework. The two outermost sections have small iron hinges built into them so that they can be opened, as well as iron latches to lock them in place when they're closed. The windows look out into the parapet of Area K-46. The figure on the bed is Gertruda, a neutral good female human commoner, the daughter of Mad Mary, as described in Chapter 3. Gertruda is oblivious to any danger to herself, especially from Strahd, who has charmed her. Sheltered by her mother, she was never allowed to leave the home as a child. She finally slipped away and made her way to the castle, drawn by its majesty. Gertruda is innocent, and years spent as a shut-in has twisted her sense of reality. Consequently, she maintains a fairy tale view of life. When faced with a decision, she almost always makes the most simplistic choice. She is naive to the point of being a danger to herself and others. Fortunately for her, Strahd has not yet bitten her, though he intends to. If he can do so while the characters look on helplessly, so much the better. 
next to the bed set into the north wall is a secret door. It can be pushed open to reveal a dusty hall that ends at a similar secret door to the back of the alcove of area K45. Gertruda doesn't know that this secret door exists. Area K43, the bath chamber. Red satin curtains hang in archways at both ends of the south wall in this dark room. Between them, in the center of the chamber, stands a large ornate tub with clawed feet. The tub is full of blood. Both curtained archways lead to area K44, tormented spirit. The spirit of Varushka, a maid, haunts this chamber. She took her own life when Strahd began feeding on her, denying him the chance to turn her into a vampire spawn. The blood in the tub isn't real, but rather a manifestation of Varushka's tormented spirit. If the blood is disturbed in any way, read. The blood-drenched creature explodes out of the tub and attaches to the ceiling, cackling maniacally. Blood pours off its pale flesh, bony limbs, and stringy hair as it scuttles away. The creature that erupts from the tub is no more real than the blood. It can't be harmed and doesn't attack. It scuttles across the ceiling, disappearing into area K44 through one of the archways. Once there, it disappears. Area K44, the closet. The walls here are lined with iron hooks upon which hang black capes and formal wear. Two arched windows in the south wall are covered by heavy curtains. 28 capes and 16 sets of fine clothes are stored here. Red satin drapes hang in the archway that connects this closet to the adjoining bath chamber in area K43. Area K45, the Hall of Heroes. Dark alcoves line the wall of this long hall. The ceiling has fallen here, leaving rubble strewn across the floor. Overhead, the beams of Ravenloft's roof are exposed. Lightning from the dark clouds sporadically illuminate the hall, lighting the faces of the life-sized human statues in alcoves. Each visage is frozen in terror. The ten statues that line this corridor depict ancient heroes. In actuality, the faces on the statues are stoic and expressionless, but whenever the lightning flashes, their expression changes to utter horror until the hall goes dark again. The statues are imbued with the spirit of Strahd's ancestors, all of which grieve over the termination of their bloodline. Each spirit will answer one question if addressed directly. The spirit's answers are always short and vague, and there is 20% chance that the spirit's answer is wrong. The stairs at the west end of the hall descend 40 feet to area K33. An opened archway to the east reveals a tower landing beyond as part of Area K-20. Area K-46, the parapets. You stand on a 10-foot wide walkway that encircles most of the keep. The drizzle of rain continues, punctuated by the occasional clap of thunder or stroke of lightning. Far below these parapets are shining wet cobblestones of the courtyard. The walkway runs around the front of the uppermost portion of the keep. Battlemented walkways extend from the keep north, south, and east to the outer walls of the castle as well. See map 2 for the length and location of the castle walls. All the windows leading from this area into the keep are shut and locked, but can easily be broken. If the characters loiter on the parapets or atop the castle walls for more than five minutes, they encounter Strahd's animated armor, making the rounds. It patrols the parapets and the outer walls of Ravenloft day and night, under a darkened sky, characters without dark vision are more likely to hear the clatter of the armor approaching before they can see it. The armor can't be salvaged if it's reduced to zero hit points. Strahd's animated armor. The armor that Strahd wore into battle when he was alive lives on today as a headless animated suit of plate armor. The armor is painted burgundy and adorned with golden angelic motifs. Things of evil. Strahd imbued this automaton with a sliver of his being, bequeathing unto his armor a malevolence not found in most animated objects. He also fortified his armor and placed a number of permanent spell effects on it 
to make the armor a better castle defender. The armor understands common, but only obeys the commands of its master. Spires of Ravenloft Refer to map 6 through to 10 of Castle Ravenloft for areas K47 through K60. Area K47 The Portrait of Strahd you come to a dark landing 10 feet wide and 20 feet long. A cold draft of wind rushes down the spiral staircase at the north end of the east wall and whistles mournfully through the room before streaming down to the stairs to the south. An ornate square rug covers the floor to the south. Set into the west wall is an iron-bound wooden door with a wooden trapdoor set into the floor in front of it. Hanging on the north wall above the trap door is a framed portrait of a handsome, well-dressed man with a serene yet penetrating gaze. The ornate rug is actually a rug of smothering. It attacks creatures other than undead that move across it or anyone who tries to move it or otherwise disturb it. Underneath the rug is a bare stone floor. The wooden square trap door is four feet on a side and as thick as the floor, with recessed iron hinges and an iron ring built into the side opposite of the hinges. Pulling up on the ring opens the door. Below the trap door, characters see one of two things, either a 170 foot deep shaft to area K31A, or if the elevator trap has been activated in area K61, a stone elevator compartment with a secret hatch in its top. The portrait on the wall depicts Strad von Zarovich before he became a vampire. Even in life he was pale. The eyes of the portrait seem to watch and follow the characters as they explore the area. The picture frame is bolted to the wall and can't be removed without destroying it. If the characters attack the rug or the picture, or if they attempt to remove either item, the Guardian portrait, as described in Appendix D, attacks. The Guardian Portrait a guardian portrait looks like a finely rendered and beautifully framed work of art, usually depicting someone important in a realistic manner. The picture and its frame are bound with powerful magic and are inseparable. Living Image The eyes of the figure depicted in the painting are imbued with dark vision and they appear to follow creatures that move in front of them. Innate Spells When a guardian portrait attacks, the figure in the painting animates and moves as though alive, albeit in two dimensions. The Guardian portrait has no effective melee attacks, but it has a repertoire of innate spells that it can cast. When it casts a spell, the figure painted on the canvas makes all the appropriate somatic gestures and verbal incantations for the spell. Area K48 The Off Stair This spiraling staircase is dark and dusty, this stairway rises from Area K-47, past Area K-54, to Area K-57. Area K-49, The Lounge As thunder shakes the tower, heavy beams groan under the weight of the ceiling. Three on eight lanterns hang by chains from these beams, each casting a dim glow. The curved west wall is fitted with three windows of leaded glass in steel latticework. A bookcase sits on the east wall between two doors. Plush overstuffed chairs and couches are placed about the room. The fabric has faded with age, and the patterns it depicts are nearly gone. Lounging in one couch is a handsome young man whose attire, while elegant, is worn and faded. The youthful man on the couch is Escher, a dashing vampire spawn to whom Strad has shown favor in the past. Escher is feeling somewhat neglected of late and has retreated here until Strahd's mood improves. If attacked, he hurls himself out the window and lands like a cat on the roof of the keep in Area K-53. He leads pursuers right to Strahd, wherever the lord of the castle happens to be, and regardless of whether the characters are ready to face Strahd. In conversation, Escher displays wit and a hint of melancholy. Beneath his arc mood is a dread that Strahd is growing bored of him and will lock him in the catacombs, Area K-84, with Strahd's other cast-off consorts. The leaded windows are fitted with iron hinges and can be opened. They can be locked from the inside, though they are currently unlocked. 
the leaded glass doesn't allow for much of a view. If a character opens a window and leaves it open, there's a 50% chance that a vampire spawn crawling on the outside of the wall of the tower notices the open window and investigates. The books in the bookcase have no value and aren't of much help to the characters. Some of the titles found on the bookshelf include Embalming, The Lost Art, Life Among the Undead, Learning to Cope, Castle Building 101, and The Goats of Balatok Mountains. Treasure. On the third finger of his left hand, Escher wears a platinum ring engraved with tiny roses and thorns, worth 150 gold pieces. Around his neck, he wears a gold and ruby pendant, worth 750 gold pieces. Area K50, the guest room. A large bed sits in the center of this room, its four corner posts supporting a black canopy trimmed with gold tassels. Several comfortable divans are placed about the room. There is a banded door in the west wall and a smaller unbanded door in the east wall. There is no danger in this area during the day, but if the characters try to take a short rest here during the night, the rest is interrupted by the arrival of 1d4 Barovian witches from area K56. They try to subdue the party with sleep spells. A witch retreats to area K56 if wounded. Area K51, the closet. This small wooden paneled room reeks of mildew and has a 10 foot high ceiling. Iron hooks line the wall and a dusty black coat hangs from one hook in the center of the south wall. The cloak is ordinary. The witches in area K56 placed it here to help them remember which hook opens the secret trap door in the ceiling. The trap door can be found after a search of the room and a successful DC 13 wisdom perception check. Locating the trap door doesn't enable someone to discover its opening mechanism. The door has a hidden lock and can be opened by pulling down on the hook from which the black coat hangs. Once it has been found, the trap door can be opened by pulling the hook, or it can be unlocked by someone using thieves tools, a knock spell, or similar magic. It swings down when unlocked. Area K52, the smokestack. Jutting from the steeply sloping rooftop of the castle, a spindly smokestack, five feet in diameter at the top, rises 30 feet above the roof's peak. Smoke belches from its iron pronged capstone. The chimney leads down 60 feet into the blazing fireplace in area K37. A creature that starts its turn in the chimney takes 3 or 1d6 fire damage. Area K53, the rooftop. Rain splashes against the sagging sloping rooftop. Flashes of lightning illuminate gargoyles perched on the roof's end peaks, their hideous stairs forever fixed on the courtyard, some 130 feet below. If a character tries to traverse the rooftop, read, some of the ancient roof tiles slide easily underfoot, easily dropping into the fog-shrouded darkness. Each falling tile resounds a hollow click as it hits the flagstones of the parapet in the courtyard below. A character must succeed on a DC-15 dexterity acrobatics check to traverse the roof. The check succeeds automatically if the character crawls. If the check fails by five or more, the character slides off the edge of the roof and falls 40 feet to the castle parapet in area K46. Area K54, the familiar room. The low ceiling of this 20 foot square room presses down on you. Torn and broken couches lie in heaps, haphazardly strewn about. Deep claw marks cover the hard wood furniture and the once lush upholstery has been sliced to shreds. From the dark shadows amid the rubble, three pairs of green eyes stare back at you. Three cats are familiars of the witches in area K56. If the familiars see the characters here, the witches are alerted to their presence. Area K55, the element room. Heavy beams support the ceiling of this large room, the outer wall of which curves to follow the shape of the tower. Dim light filters into the room through the steel lattice squares of two leaded glass windows. Several tables stand throughout the room, weighed down by stacks of glass jars and bottles, all of them bearing labels. The labeled glass containers hold various elements that the witches use in their fell concoctions and rituals. 
The labels identify items such as Eye of Newt, Hair of Bat, Snail Hearts, and Frog's Breath. There are no magic potions among the bottles and jars. The leaded windows are fitted with iron hinges and can be opened. They are currently locked from the inside. If a character opens a window and leaves it open, there's a 50% chance that a vampire spawn crawling around the outside wall of the tower notices the window and investigates. Characters who search the room spot numerous boot prints in the dust, as well as a short trail in the dust on the floor leading from the northeast corner of the room to the easternmost door. It looks like something heavy was dragged across the floor towards the doorway. There is a secret trap door in the northeast corner of the floor. Because of the trail through the dust, the trap door can be found without an ability check. Tapping or knocking on the trap door three times releases a hidden latch causing the trap door to swing down. Area K51 lies below. There's no ability check that will let the characters figure out the trick to opening the door. They can get the information from the witches, or perhaps by using a divination spell or similar magic. Area K56 The Cauldron Characters who stand outside the door of this room can smell a pungent odour coming from within. If the witches in this room have not been warned that the characters are coming, the characters can hear their horrid cackling. If the characters open the door slightly, they witness the scene as described below. Green glowing wisps of steam bubble up from a fat black cauldron in the center of this dark oppressive room. Surrounding the cauldron are several gaunt women in soiled black robes. These witches sit hunched on tall wooden stools, their tangled hair tucked under black pointed hats. They take turns tossing ingredients into the cauldron, uttering fell incantations and cackling maniacally. If the witches know the characters are coming, read the following text instead. Green glowing wisps of steam bubble up from a fat black cauldron in the center of this oppressive room. Surrounding the cauldron are seven tall wooden stools. The Barovian witches that dwell in this area have sworn themselves to Strahd's service in exchange for arcane power. Seven witches are present when the characters arrive minus any that might have been encountered and defeated in Area K-50. If the witches are expecting the characters, they cast invisibility spells and stand quietly in the corners of the room, hoping that the cauldron draws their prey inside. Although they prefer to attack at range with their spells, they can grow magic claws using Alter Self. When the cauldron is touched by someone who also speaks the proper command word, Gora. It magically heats any liquid placed inside of it and remains hot for three hours, or until the command word is spoken again by someone within five feet of the cauldron. Once the cauldron's properties have been used, the cauldron can't be activated again until the next dawn. Captured witches will trade information in exchange for their lives and freedom, and can be forced to divulge the command word for activating and deactivating the cauldron. They also know how to open the trap door in Area K-55. Treasure Each witch carries a potion of healing that she made herself. There's a 30% chance that the potion has gone bad, in which case it's actually a potion of poison. Not visible from the entrance is a small table behind the cauldron, on which sits an open spellbook, seemingly on the verge of falling apart. The book is evil. Any non-evil character that touches it or starts its turn with the book in its possession, takes 5 or 1d10 psychic damage. The book contains the following spells. At first level, Burning Hands, Charm Person, Detect Magic, Find Familiar, Fog Cloud, Mage Armor, Protection from Evil and Good, Ray of Sickness, Sleep, Tasha's Hideous Laughter, Unseen Servant, Witch Bolt. And at second level, Alter Self, Arcane Lock, Cloud of Daggers, Darkness, Enlarge Reduce, Invisibility, Knock, and Misty Step. Area K57, The Tower Roof This 60 foot diameter tower roof is rimmed with battlements. A slender stone bridge with no railing spans the gap between this tower and the slightly taller tower to the north. To the east, the high tower of Ravenloft thrusts skyward, with no apparent opening at this level. Black boiling clouds hurl rain down from above. 
The courtyard is 190 feet below. The roof of this keep, 80 feet below. A stone railing encloses the stone spiral staircase that descends into the tower. Area K58, the bridge. A strong wind blows across this slender bridge of stone and masonry. The bridge's old iron railings have rusted away years ago, leaving the bridge without handholds. The bridge connects areas K20 and K57. The wind isn't strong enough to knock characters off the bridge, but a creature that takes damage while standing on the bridge must succeed on a DC 10 dexterity saving throw or fall 60 feet onto the roof of the keep. Area K59, the high tower peak. If characters climb the stairs to reach the tower peak, read, the spiral staircase finally ends at a five foot wide stone walkway that circles the shaft. In the center of the tower's highest floor, a 15-foot diameter hole drops onto the cold heart of Ravenloft itself. Cold air rushes up out of the shaft, sending a chill through you. Arrow slits line the walls, and aging beams support a steep cone-shaped roof. One beam of the part of the roof has fallen away, leaving a gaping hole open to the stormy sky. The hole in the roof forms the mouth of an enclosed shaft of area K18A, that descends 450 feet to the castle catacombs of area K84. Piddlewick II Hiding in the rafters is Piddlewick II. A character spots Piddlewick II with a passive wisdom perception score that meets or exceeds its dexterity stealth check. If Piddlewick II is spotted, read, Something lurks amongst the rafters. A small spindly man not much larger than a child. A flash of lightning illuminates its face, which is painted like a grinning jack-o'-lantern. Although he appears to be a petite man wearing face paint and a fool's costume, Piddlewick is actually a clockwork effigy of the real-life Piddlewick, who lies entombed in the catacombs. The dark paint on his face is soot. If the characters see Piddlewick II in bright light, read... It's obvious to you that you're not looking at a small man, but a mockery of one. This thing is not a creature of flesh and bone, but a construct made of dry leather stitched tightly and wrapped over an articulated frame. You hear the soft tumbling and clicking of gears. Piddlewick II can't speak and doesn't have an expressive face, so he relies mostly on hand gestures and simple diagrams to communicate. He understands common, but can't read or write. If the characters show kindness to the clockwork effigy, it accompanies them and tries its best to be helpful and entertaining. It knows its way around the castle and can serve as a silent guide. If one or more characters are mean towards Piddlewick II, its quiet resentment of them grows, and at some point, when the group is at the top of the staircase, it pushes one of the offending party members down the stairs. The target must succeed on a DC-10 dexterity saving throw, or tumble to the bottom of the staircase, taking 1d6 bludgeoning damage per 10 feet fallen. Piddlewick II After her husband died in battle, Duchess Dorfnaya de Silna set her sights on becoming Count Strad von Zarevich's bride, but she failed to win his love. Her visits to the castle were nonetheless frequent, and she never travelled without her fool, the delightful Piddlewick. The little man was like a ray of sunshine in Castle Ravenloft, and though he failed to amuse Strad, he delighted Tatiana and Sergi with his jokes and gambles. As a result, Strad didn't object whenever Piddlewick and the Duchess came to visit. Eager to please and desiring to return the courtesy, the Duchess commissioned the legendary toy maker Fritz von Werg to build a clockwork effigy of Piddlewick as a gift for Strad's family. Although the Duchess's heart was in the right place, the effigy didn't have Piddlewick's abilities, and it failed to entertain anyone, even though Piddlewick himself had spent months training it. The effigy couldn't speak, and its movements were more awkward than amusing. A harsh winter trapped the Duchess, her fool, and her fool's effigy in Castle Ravenloft for several months. The Duchess subsequently succumbed to illness, after which Tatiana asked Piddlewick to remain in Castle Ravenloft. One Piddlewick too many. Von Werg was no ordinary toy maker. He put a little of himself into all his creations, 
which is to say, his work had a touch of creator's madness. Piddlewick II knew that it had no purpose as long as Piddlewick remained in Castle Ravenloft, so it pushed Piddlewick down a long flight of stairs, killing him. Everyone else thought it was an accident. Piddlewick II tried its best to fulfill its namesake's shoes, but the effigy's mere presence was upsetting to Tatiana, and it was never called on to perform. Eventually it was shut away like a discarded toy. Evil toy. Piddlewick II was kept in a small closet adjacent to one of the guest bedrooms. On rare occasions when someone stayed there, Piddlewick would sneak out of the closet in the middle of the night and smother the guest with a pillow, then retreat back into the closet. The castle staff never considered that the effigy might be responsible, instead assuming that the guest had died in their sleep. But Straub was not fooled. He came to realize fairly quickly that the clockwork effigy had begun to display a murderous nature. Rather than have Piddlewick II destroyed, Strahd kept the fool around to dispose of irksome guests from time to time. After the deaths of Sergei and Tatiana, the castle became virtually abandoned, and there were no more guests for Piddlewick II to entertain. The clockwork effigy emerged from its closet and found new places to hide. It fears Strahd and eagerly follows anyone who gives it attention that it craves. Piddlewick II is basically an oversized toy, a four foot tall mechanism stuffed with gears, springs and other components expertly fitted together to impart some semblance of life to it. Its skin is made of stitched leather, pulled taut over an articulated wood frame. Piddlewick II has rubbed soot around its eyes and mouth, giving it the triangular eyes and jagged grin of a jack-o'-lantern. Piddlewick II's traits His ideal I wish I could make people happy. Bond. I would like to find someone, anyone, who isn't afraid of me and who enjoys my company. Floor. When I'm upset, I do bad things. Area K60, the North Tower Peak. If the characters climb the stairs to this area, read. The stairs end at a dark and dreary room with manacles attached to the walls. In the middle of the room is a wood frame bed, fitted with leather restraints. At the foot of the bed rests a closed iron chest, its lid sculpted with an emblem. A wooden ladder leads up to a trap door in the ceiling. Thin streams of water drip through the trap door's rotting wood, forming a puddle around the base of the ladder. The ceiling here is nine feet high. The manacles are rusted and can be easily torn from the walls. The trap door in the ceiling leads to the tower rooftop, area K60A. The emblem worked into the lid of the iron chest is Strahd's family crest. Cyrus Bellevue, as described in area K62, stashed the chest here for safekeeping. Treasure. The iron chest is locked, and the key is with Cyrus Bellevue in area K62. The chest contains a bejeweled gold crown worth 2,500 gold pieces, resting on a silk pillow. Teleport Destination Characters who teleport to this destination from Area K-78 arrive in the middle of the room. Fortunes of Ravenloft If your card reading reveals that there is a treasure here, the One of Stars, the Transmuter, it is inside the Iron Chest. If your card reading indicates an encounter with Strahd in this area, the marionette, the Jack of Hearts. He is standing next to the iron chest. Area K60A, the North Tower rooftop. A cold wind greets you atop the tower roof, its rain slicked flagstone surrounded by a 20 foot diameter ring of stone battlements. The thunderclouds above suddenly coalesce into the terrible visage of Strahd. The face utters a ghastly moan as a thousand bats fly out of its gaping maw and descend upon the tower. Characters who remain on the roof are accosted by ten swarms of bats, which arrive in three rounds. If the characters descend into the tower, the bats don't follow, and instead fly to the high tower in area K-59, descend its central shaft in area K-18A, and roost in the catacombs of area K-84. The courtyard lies 260 feet below, 
and the roof of the keep is 130 feet below. Larders of Ill Omen Refer to map 11 of the castle areas K61 through K72. Area K61, the elevator trap. See area K31 and the accompanying elevator trap diagram before running this encounter. This dusty 10 foot wide, 30 foot long corridor has a flat ceiling 10 feet overhead. To the south, a web filled stairway spirals down into darkness. The north end of the hall ends at a wooden door. This hallway contains an elevator trap, triggered when at least 400 pounds of pressure is applied to the 10 foot square section of floor in the center of the hall, marked T on the map, or when the lever in area K31 is raised. A party of adventurers moving in close formation down the hall is certainly heavy enough to trigger the trap. A character who searches for traps while crossing the hall and succeeds on a DC 15 wisdom perception check detects seams in the floors, walls, and ceiling that suggest that the middle section isn't attached to the rest of the hall. A character who makes a successful DC 15 intelligence investigation check discerns that the trap can't be disarmed from this location. The middle 10 foot section of the hall is a cleverly hidden elevator compartment open to the north and south so that it appears to be part of the passageway. When the trap is sprung, two steel portcullises drop from the ceiling at lightning speed to seal off the compartment, trapping within those creatures that triggered the trap. An instant later, the closed off elevator is propelled up to the western half of a 20 foot wide, 170 foot tall shaft, area K31A, to the surrounds of turning gears and rattling chains. Magic sleeping gas fills the compartment as it rises, and creatures trapped inside must succeed on a DC 15 constitution saving throw, or fall unconscious as though affected by the sleep spell. At the same time the elevator rises, a 10 foot cube of granite suspended from heavy chains descends in the eastern half of the shaft, acting as a counterweight. The massive block lands gently at the bottom of the shaft, filling the previously open 10 by 10 foot space adjacent to where the elevator stood. The block weighs thousands of tons and pulverizes anything in the space where it comes to rest. Once the elevator starts rising, its portcullises are locked in place and can't be lifted. The walls on the shaft are nearly flush with the elevator compartment. Only a few inches of space exists between the portcullises and the shaft walls. All creatures trapped inside the elevator including the unconscious ones, must roll initiative. The compartment takes one round to reach the top of the shaft, stopping just beneath area K47. Each creature inside has one turn to act before the compartment comes to a dead stop. Their initiative rolls determine the order in which the occupants act. Conscious party members can take whatever actions they like. They might search for a way out, wake up sleeping party members, cast spells, or take other actions. Unconscious ones can do nothing. A character who uses an action to search the ceiling of the elevator finds a secret trap door with a successful DC 10 wisdom perception check. The trap door opens downward. Any creature on top of the elevator when it reaches the top of the shaft must make a successful DC 15 dexterity saving throw to avoid being crushed against the ceiling of the shaft. The character takes 44 or 8d10 bludgeoning damage on a failed save, or half as much on a successful one. When the elevator comes to a stop, its portcullises retract. The elevator remains at the top of the shaft until the lever in area K31 is moved to the down position. When that happens, the trap resets in one round. The portcullises come down, and the elevator compartments descend to the place in the hallway at the bottom of the shaft, as the stone block rises to the top of the shaft. When the elevator reaches the bottom, its portcullises rise again. Development The sound of the elevator moving can be heard throughout the castle. Characters who are trapped or asleep in the elevator compartment are easy prey for Strahd, who can reach them by way of the trap door in Area K-47. Area K-62 The Servants' Hall This hall stands in deadly silence. Heavy beams support a sagging 10-foot-high ceiling, Fog clings to the floor, 
obscuring everything that lies less than three feet above it. A giant shadow lurches across the ceiling as dark figures shuffle purposefully down the corridor towards you. The figure approaching is Cyrus Bellevue, a mongrel folk and Strahd's faithful servant. He stands four feet nine inches tall, but appears shorter because of his hunched posture. He has the keen hearing and smell feature. The left side of his face is covered with lizard scales, and he has the ears of a panther. His left foot looks like a duck's webbed foot, and his arms have patches of black dog fur. The light in the hall comes from a lantern on the floor behind Cyrus. If the characters have their own light sources, Cyrus sees them, but he will not attack first. He wears a loop of twine around his neck, hanging from which is an iron key and a decorative wooden pendant fitted with a varnished human eyeball. The key unlocks the iron chest in area K60. The wooden pendant is a hag eye given to Cyrus by the night hag Morgantha, as described in chapter 6, so that she could spy on Strahd. Cyrus doesn't know that the necklace is magical, but the hags can see through it as an action. Poor old Cyrus is obviously crazy. He has served the master for uncounted years and is devoted to him. Cyrus tries to get the characters to retire to their room in the tower, area K49. If the characters aren't sure what room he's talking about, he offers to lead them there. If the characters follow Cyrus, he tells them to stay close to him as he leads them through the south door to area K61 and deliberately sets off the elevator trap there. Cyrus tries his best not to succumb to the sleeping gas as the elevator compartment climbs the shaft to area K31 and he has advantage on the saving throw. Assuming he is still conscious when the elevator compartment reaches the top of the shaft, Cyrus opens the trap door to area K47 and either leads the characters to area K49 or, if they're unconscious, drags them there. After assuring the characters who are conscious that the master will be along shortly. Cyrus then makes his way back downstairs to the kitchen in area K65. If the characters don't go to their room, Cyrus shakes his head and returns to the work of preparing his dinner in area K65. If the characters take his key, he screams, Master will not be pleased! and begins to moan and slap his head, obviously upset. A successful DC-10 Charisma Intimidation check is enough to make him divulge the key's purpose, the location of the iron chest and the chest continents. When he isn't being threatened, Cyrus giggles to himself from time to time for no clear reason. He also likes to tell poor jokes at the most inopportune moments. Stairs at the east end of the North Hall lead up to area K-23. Along the east wall is a rusted but sturdy iron portcullis that bars the way to area K-63. If the characters peer through the portcullis, read the box text from area K-63. The portcullis bars are one inch thick and spaced four inches apart. The portcullis can be lifted with a successful DC-20 strength check. The double doors at the west end of the hall are made of heavy planks banded with steel. They open into area K-67. Area K-63 the wine cellar. Arch frames of stone form a low, wet ceiling over this wine cellar. Great casks line the walls, their bands rusting and their contents long spilled onto the floor. A few hungry rats make their home here, but upon your sudden arrival, they retreat into the shadows. The rats are harmless. Cyrus Bellevue, as described in Area K-62, treats them like pets. Characters who search the room find a crack at the southern end of the west wall. The crack is half an inch wide, five inches tall, and twelve inches deep. It leads to area K-18. The wine casks. Each of the twelve large casks here rest on its side in a heavy wooden brace. Three casks stand against a north wall, six against the east wall, and three against the southern wall. Decorative lettering is burned into the top of each cask, showing the winery's name, the Wizards of Wine, and the name of the wine on the cask. The Northern Casks All three of these casks are rotted and empty. The wine's name is Champagne de la Stomp. Eastern Casks 
Five of these casks are rotted and empty. The wine name burned onto each is Red Dragon Crush. Lining the interior of the sixth one is a patch of yellow mold as described in the Dungeon Master's Guide. A character who inspects the cask closely and succeeds on a DC 13 wisdom perception check sees yellow mold in the cracks between the planks of the cask. If this cask is smashed open, the yellow mold releases a cloud of spores. Yellow Mold A Hazard from the Dungeon Master's Guide Yellow mold grows in dark places, and one patch covers a five foot square. If touched, the mold ejects a cloud of spores that fills a ten foot cube originating from the mold. Any creature in that area must succeed on a DC 15 constitution saving throw, or take 11 or 2d10 poison damage and become poisoned for one minute. While poisoned in this way, the creature takes 5 or 1d10 poison damage at the start of each of its turns. The creature can repeat the saving throw at the end of each of its turns, ending the effect on itself on a successful save. Sunlight or any amount of fire damage instantly destroys one patch of yellow mold. Southern Casks Two of these casks are rotted and empty. The wine name burned in on each is Purple Grape Marsh number 3. The middle one is home to a purplish black pudding that bursts forth if the cask is broken open. Fortunes of Ravenloft If your card reading reveals that a treasure is here, the Four of Coins, the Merchant, it is inside one of the empty casks along the north wall, hidden there by Cyrus Bellevue. Area K64, The Guard's Stair The long, hollow sigh of the wind breathes a semblance of life into this otherwise featureless staircase. The stairway starts at Area K68 and goes up past Area K13 to Area K46. Area K65, the kitchen. A horrible odour of decay fills this steamy hot room. A huge pot bubbles over a blazing fire pit in the centre of the room, its green muddy contents churning. The far wall is lined with pegs, hanging from which are numerous large cooking implements, some of which could easily double as implements of torture. If a character looks into the pot, three human zombies rise up from the bubbling depths and attack. The zombies are slowly being boiled to death, and each one only has 13 hit points remaining. If Cyrus Bellevue from Area K62 is present when the zombies attacks, he grabs a heavy club and tries to beat them back into the pot. Cyrus explains that he isn't the cook that he used to be, and his meals tend to get out of hand these days. Area K66, the butler's quarters. This 20 foot square room is filled wall to wall with clutter. A long sagging bed sits to one side under a huge faded tapestry that depicts Castle Ravenloft. Dusty lanterns sit in various places, and bright curtains are draped haphazardly around the room. Thousands of pieces of junk cover the floor. Broken swords, crumpled shields, and helmets lie in piles all about. Cyrus Bellevue, from Area K-62, uses this room as his lair. There is nothing of value here. If Cyrus is with the party, the characters notice that he is caressing their equipment and chuckling to himself. Cyrus has been salvaging equipment from dead adventurers for years. He looks forward to adding to his collection after Strahd gets through with the characters. Area K-67, the Hall of Bones. Once a mess hall for the castle guards, this room is now desiccated grounds, as described in the Wilderness Hazards of the Dungeon Master's Guide. Desecrated Ground, a wilderness hazard from the Dungeon Master's Guide. Some cemeteries and catacombs are imbued with an unseen trace of ancient evil. An area of desecrated ground can be of any size, and a detect evil and good spell cast within range reveals its presence. Undead standing on desecrated ground have advantage on all saving throws. A vial of holy water purifies a ten-foot square area of desecrated ground when sprinkled on it and a hallow spell purifies the desecrated ground within its area. Dark stains cover the floor of this area. Large oak tables, scarred and beaten, lay scattered like toys about the room. Their wood crushed and splintered. 
replacing them are furnishings made entirely of human bones. The walls of the 20 foot high vaulted ceiling are a sickly yellow colour, not because of faded or time worn plaster, but because they are adorned with bones and skulls arranged in a morbidly decorative fashion, giving the room a cathedral like quality. Four enormous mounds of bones occupy the corner of this ossuary, and garlands of skulls extend from these mounds to a chandelier of bones that hangs from the ceiling above, a long table constructed of bones in the center of the room. Ten chairs made of bones and festooned with decorative skulls surround the table. Resting atop, which is an ornate bowl-shaped vessel made of yet more bones. The doors to the north and south are sheathed in bones, but the steel-banded double doors in the center of the east wall are not. Above these eastern doors is the mounted skull of a dragon. Cyrus Bellevue from Area K-62 created this enormous work of art out of the bones of dead servants and slain adventurers. It has taken him many years to complete it. The bones and skulls are held together with grey mortar and white paste. The dark stains on the floor are old bloodstains, caused here when Strahd hunted down and killed the remainder of his castle guards. The dragon skull mounted above the eastern doors belonged to Argenvost, as described in Chapter 7, a silver dragon that was killed in the valley by Strahd and his army before founding the castle of Ravenloft. The skull weighs 250 pounds. Fortunes of Ravenloft If your card reading reveals that a treasure is here, the Six of Glyphs, the Anarchist, it is lying on the bone table. If your card reading indicates an encounter with Strahd in this area, Dunjun, the King of Clubs, he is sitting comfortably at one end of the table, holding the skull of a long dead foe. Area K-68, the guards run. This ten foot wide arched corridor is cold and moist. The cold seems to emanate from an open archway in the west hall. The archway leads to area K69. A door at the north end of the hall opens up to area K67. To the south, the hallway ends at the foot of a staircase, area K64, that spirals upwards. Area K69, the guards' quarters. Sickly yellow lichen covers the ceiling of this cold, damp, ten-foot-wide passage, running east to west. Opening off both sides of the passage are ten-foot square alcoves that contain rotting cots, rags, and the skeletal remains of castle guards. Deathly silence fills the hall. The yellow lichen is harmless. When one or more characters reach the midpoint of the hall, ten human skeletons leap from the alcoves and attack. Area K-70, the Kingsmen Hall. This 30-foot square room is in shambles. Scattered furniture lies in heaps near the walls. Broken bones lie scattered amid crumpled and crushed plate armor. Shields and swords jut from the walls as if driven into them by some tremendous force. Two doors stand opposite one another, in the center of the north wall and the south wall. A dark archway leads out through the east wall. After Strahd was transformed into a vampire, several of the castle guards retreated to this room, but Strahd caught them and slaughtered them in a brutal show of violence. Removing one of the shields or swords from the wall require a DC-10 strength check. None of the items found here are valuable. Area K-71, the Kinsmen Quarters. This dark passage runs 20 feet connecting an archway to the west with an ascending stone staircase to the east. To the north and south are four ten-foot square alcoves, cluttered with rotting cots and dirty rags. The ceilings here are covered with yellow lichen. The yellow lichen is harmless. Beyond the archway to the west is area K-70. The staircase, area K-20A, that goes up along the east wall leads to area K-20. Treasure Three of the alcoves contain nothing of value. A loose flagstone in the southeast alcove covers a hidden cubby hole in the floor, in which is hidden a moldy sack containing 150 electrum pieces. The coin have the profiled visage of Strad von Zarevich stamped on them. A character who searches the alcove can find the loose flagstone with a successful DC-10 wisdom perception check. 
Area K-72, the Chamberlain's office. This shadowy room is in perfect order. A great table stands here with its chair, inkwell and quill set carefully in place. Lances, swords and shields that bear the Barovian crests are hung neatly in the dark oak panelled walls. If he has not been defeated elsewhere, Rahadan is here, waiting for the characters to arrive so he can kill them. A shadow demon also haunts this room. In the round after the characters engage with Rahadan, the demon leaps out and attacks the nearest character from behind. The character doesn't notice the demon unless the character's passive wisdom perception score meets or exceeds the demon's dexterity stealth check. Both Rahadan and the shadow demon fights until slain. A secret door set into the north end of the west wall can be pulled open to reveal a dusty, web-cloaked staircase of an ancient worn stone of area K-79 that descends into darkness. Dungeons and Catacombs Refer to map 12 of the castle for areas K-73 through K-88. Area K-73, the Dungeon Hall the following box text assumes that the characters arrive here by way of the staircase to the east in area K-21, adjust as needed if the characters enter this hall from another direction. The stairs descend into black still water that fills an arched hallway before you. The water's surface is like a dark mirrored glass, disturbed only occasionally by a thick thwop of a drop falling from the ceiling. Twenty feet ahead, Arched doorways lead downward from each side of the hallway. In each arched doorway, an iron door stands closed and partially submerged. You hear a weak cry for help beyond the south door. The water is three feet deep in the hallway and opaque. The steps on both sides of the hallway descend another two feet before ending at the iron doors in the north and south. The floor beneath the water isn't as solid as one might expect. There is a safe path around the weight-sensitive trap doors, as described in Arius K-73, but the water makes it impossible to see where the trap doors are. For every 10 pounds of weight on a trap door, there is a 5% chance that the trap door will open. The 10-foot deep pit under each trap door contains a magic teleporting trap that activates as soon as the trap door opens. Any medium or smaller creature on the trap door, when it opens, plunges into the pit and is teleported to a cell in either area K-74 or K-75 as the diagram indicates. When a character sets off a trap, other characters in the hall see an explosion of air and water fly up around the triggering character, air that was trapped in the pit suddenly released when the trap door opens. The triggering character suddenly falls from sight, an instant later the trap door closes leaving only a slowly dissipating swirl in the water. It doesn't open again until 24 hours have passed, at which point its teleport trap is recharged. A character who falls victim to the teleport trap are transported to the dungeon cells enclosed with iron bars and under 5 feet of brackish water in area K-74 and areas K-75. Area K-74, the North Dungeon the rusty iron door connecting this hall to area K-73 is submerged in 5 feet of water and requires a successful DC-10 strength athletics check to open. A mold-covered ceiling hangs 3 feet above the still black water that fills this dungeon corridor. The water is 5 feet deep. 10 foot square cells, their entrances blocked by iron bars, line both sides of the hall. One of the cells is dimly lit. The corridor is 40 feet long, branching off at 8 cells, 4 along each wall. Light spills out of area K-74H. A hinged door made up of 1 inch thick rusted iron bars spaced 4 inches apart, with a horizontal crossbar spaced 6 inches apart, closes off each cell. Each door is fitted with an iron lock. A character using thieves tools can try to pick the lock which requires one minute and a successful DC-20 dexterity check. The check is made with disadvantage if the character is trying to pick the lock from inside the cell. If the check fails, the character can try again. 
A character can force open a barred door by using an action and succeeding on a DC 25 strength check. Strahd visits the dungeon occasionally to see whether any character has become trapped here. He can enter a cell by assuming mist form. Area K-74A, Forgotten Treasure. This cell is linked to a teleport trap in Area K-73. Characters who enter the cell can feel coins shifting beneath their feet. Treasure. Scattered across the floor of this cell are 3,000 electron pieces. The coins have the profiled viziers of Strad von Zarevich stamped on them. A character can scoop up 100 coins every minute. Area K-74B, Forgotten Treasure The rusted doors to this cell hang open slightly. Characters who enter the cell can feel coins shifting beneath their feet. Treasure Scattered across the floor of this cell are 300 platinum pieces. The coins have the profiled visage of Strad von Zarevich stamped on them. A character can scoop up 100 coins every minute. Area K-74C the rotting corpse. Clinging to the bars of this otherwise empty cell is the rotting corpse of a male half-elf, dressed in leather armor. This cell is linked to the teleport trap in Area K-73. Treasure. A search of the corpse yields a sheathed longsword and two belt pouches, one containing five gemstones worth 50 gold pieces each, the other containing a potion of heroism. Area K-74D. The empty cell. This cell contains nothing of interest. Area K-74E. End of the ride. This cell is linked to the teleport trap in Area K-73. Secret door. A secret door is five feet up from the floor on the north wall of this cell. The secret door can't be opened from this side without the use of a knock spell or similar magic. Behind the secret door is a chute of polished black marble that slants upwards from Area K-82. Area K-74F, the empty cell. This cell contains nothing of interest. Area K-74G, the grey ooze. Clinging to the floor of this cell is a grey ooze that attacks anything that enters. While underwater, the ooze is effectively invisible. Area K-74H, the lost sword. A glowing blade can be seen beneath water near the back of the cell. This cell is linked to a teleport trap in Area K-73. Treasure. The source of the underwater glow is a sentient lawful good plus one short sword with intelligence 11, wisdom 13, and charisma 13. It has hearing and normal vision out to a range of 120 feet. It communicates by transmitting emotion to the creature carrying or wielding it. The sword's purpose is to fight evil. The sword has the following additional properties. The sword continuously sheds bright light in a 15 foot radius and dim light for an additional 15 feet. Only by destroying the sword can this light be extinguished. A lawful good creature can attune itself to the sword in one minute. While attuned to this weapon, the sword's wielder can use the sword to cast the crusader's mantle spell. Once used, this property of the sword can't be used again until the next dawn. Area K-75, the South Dungeon The rusty iron door connecting the hall to Area K-73 is submerged in 5 feet of water and requires a successful DC-10 strength athletics check to open. A mold-covered ceiling hangs 3 feet above the still black water that fills this dungeon corridor. The water is 5 feet deep. Ten-foot square cells, their entrances blocked by iron bars, line both sides of the hall. From one of the cells, you hear a gruff voice ask, Who's there? The corridor is 40 feet long. Branching off are eight cells, four along each wall. The voice comes from one of the southmost cells in Area K-75A. Area K-75A, the prisoner. A strong young man clutches the bars of his cell, while struggling to keep his teeth from chattering. His clothes are shredded, and he is soaked from head to toe. The man is Emil Torinescu, a werewolf with 72 hit points. He claims to be a resident of Valakai who was chased by direwolves to the castle. He begs characters to rescue him, offering to help them in exchange. In truth, 
Strahd locked Emil here as punishment for causing a schism in his werewolf pack, as described in chapter 15. Anxious to prove his worth to Strahd, Emil rewards the characters for freeing him by attacking them when a good opportunity arises. Emil doesn't turn against the characters if they claim to be allies of his wife, Zalika, as described in chapter 15. In that case, he tries to leave the castle and reunite with her, staying with the characters only until an opportunity to leave presents itself. Area K-75B Forgotten Treasure Characters who enter the cell can feel coins shifting beneath their feet. Treasure Scattered across the floor of this cell are 2,100 Electrum pieces. The coins have the profiled visage of Strad von Zarevich stamped on them. A character can scoop up 100 coins every minute. Area K-75C Empty Cell This cell contains nothing of interest. Area K-75D The Dead Dwarf this cell is linked with the teleport trap in Area K-73. The skeletal remains of a dwarf fighter lies at the bottom of the cell, enclosed in rusted plate armor. The dwarf's non-magical but usable battle axe lies nearby. Area K-75E, the empty cell. This cell contains nothing of interest. Area K-75F, the dead wizard. Shackled to the back wall of this cell, is an emaciated figure in a blue robe, its spindly arms spread wide and its head tilted forward. Long grey hair hangs down in front of the dead man's face. The skeletal figure is all that remains of a human wizard whom Strahd captured and slowly bled to death. Flesh still clings to the wizard bones and puncture marks from the vampire's fangs are visible on the wizard's neck. Area K-75G, The Hanging Bard Pounded into the roof of this cell is a rusty iron pulley, strung through which is a rope tied to one of the crossbeams of the barred door. Dangling upside down from the pulley is a man, flabby and stout of build, in tight-fitting leather armor. His boots are bound with rope, just below the pulley. His fleshy hands are tied behind his back, and his head is underwater. He isn't moving. Strahd had this human bard suspended from the ceiling, as a test to see how long he could keep his head above water. The man weakened and drowned. On the floor of the cell, below the hanging corpse, is a smashed lyre. Area K-75H, an empty cell. This cell contains nothing of interest. Area K-76, the torture chamber. Dark, low shapes thrust out of the still, brackish water that fills this 50-foot square room the ceiling of which is festooned with hanging chains that look like thick black web strands. A balcony set into the north wall overlooks the room that has two large thrones atop it, with a red velvet curtain behind them. The ceiling is 17 feet above the surface of the water, which is 3 feet deep. The balcony of the north stands 7 feet above the water's surface, 10 feet above the floor. If the characters approach the dark low shapes in the water, Read, the dark shapes in the water are racks, iron maiden stocks, and other instruments of torture. The skeletons of their last victims lie within them, their jaws seemingly frozen open in silent screams. As soon as one or more of the characters moves more than ten feet into the room, six strad zombies rise slowly out of the water, their slime grey arms clawing upwards through the water as they attack. Area K-77, the observation balcony. Two large wooden thrones rest on this balcony. Behind the thrones hang red velvet curtains 30 feet long. The ceiling here is 10 feet high. The room continues behind the curtain an additional 10 feet to a wall that has a door in its center. Area K-78, the brazier room. This room is 30 feet square rising to a 20-foot-tall flat ceiling. A stone brazier burns fiercely in the center of the room, but its tall white flame produces no heat. The rim of the brazier is carved with seven cup-shaped indentations spaced evenly about the circumference. Within each indentation is a spherical stone, twice the diameter of a human eyeball, and made of a colored crystal. No two stones are the same color. 
Overhead, a wooden framed hourglass as tall and wide as a dwarf hangs ten feet above the brazier, suspended from the ceiling by thick iron chains. All the sand is stuck to the upper portion of the hourglass, seemingly unable to run down to the bottom. Written in glowing script on the base of the hourglass is a verse in common. Two nine-foot-tall iron statues of knights on horseback, poised to charge with swords drawn, stand in deep alcoves facing each other. The brazier sits between them. The two statues are iron golems. Each horse and rider is considered one creature. They are inseparable. The golems will not leave the room under any circumstances, and they attack only under specific conditions as described ahead. The hourglass has AC 12 and 20 hit points. It's immune to poison and psychic damage, and vulnerable to thunder damage. If the hourglass is reduced to zero hit points, its glass shatters, causing the sand within to fall to the floor. The magic writing on the base of the hourglass reads as follows. Cast a stone into the fire. Violet leads to the mountain spire. Orange to the castle's peak. Red if lore is what you seek. Green to where the coffins hide. Indigo to the master's bride. Blue to the ancient magic's womb. Yellow to the master's tomb. The brazier's flame is magical and sheds no warmth. A successful casting of Dispel Magic at a DC of 16 extinguishes the flame for one hour. The fire is permanently extinguished if the brazier is destroyed. The brazier has an armor class of 17 with 25 hit points, immunity to poison and psychic damage, and resistance to all other damage. The stones set into the brazier's rim are colored red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet, respectively. Tossing one into the brazier causes its flame to change from white to the color of the stone, and the sand begins to fall through the hourglass. Any creature that touches the colored flame is teleported to a location within Strahd's domain, as determined by the color. If the flame is red, they are sent to the study in Area K-37. If it is orange, they are sent to the North Tower Peak in Area K-60. If it is yellow, they are sent to Strahd's tomb in Area K-86. If it is green, they are sent to the Coffin Maker's shop in Valakai, as described in Chapter 5, Area N6F. If it is blue, they are sent to the Amber Temple in Chapter 13, Area X42. If it is indigo, they are sent to the Abbey of St. Markovia, as described in Chapter 8, Area S17. And if it is violet, they are sent to Toslinka Pass, in Chapter 9, Area T4. After five rounds, the sand runs out and the color of the flame returns to white. When the flame does so, the sand instantly reappears at the top of the hourglass, provided the hourglass is intact, and the stone that was cast into the fire reappears in the brazier's rim. If the brazier, the hourglass, or either golem is attacked, the doors to the room magically slam shut and lock, unless they have been held open or wedged open, and the golems animate an attack. On the first round, the golems fill the room with their poison breath, which issues from the horse's mouth. Each creature in the room must make two saving throws, one for each breath weapon. On subsequent rounds, each golem makes one attack with its sword and one slam attack with its hoof. When there are no creatures left in the room to fight, the golems return to their alcoves, and the doors unlock. Forcing open a locked door requires a successful DC 25 strength athletics check. Each door has an AC of 15, 25 hit points, and immunity to poison and psychic damage. Area K-79, the Western Stair. This staircase of ancient stone is worn smooth. Thick dust covers its steps, and cobwebs choke the passage. The stairs rise at a 45 degree angle for a distance of 40 feet horizontally, leading to a 10 foot square landing. A second set of stairs continues upwards to the east at a similar angle for a distance of 30 feet horizontally, ending at a secret door that opens into area K-72. The Landing Inscribed in the landing, hidden under years of dust, is a glyph of warding. If the characters brush away the dust, 
Someone can spot the glyph with a successful DC-15 intelligence investigation check. The glyph triggers the first time a living creature passes over it. Triggering it activates a major image spell, conjuring an illusion of Strad von Zarevich that appears either halfway up the stairs leading to area K-72 or halfway down the stairs leading to area K-78, so that the vampire appears in front of the triggering character. When Strad appears, read, A sickly mist fills the stairway ahead, then coalesces into the form of Vampire Strad, his eyes burning red with anger. You have worn out your welcome, he says. Whatever gods you believe in cannot save you now. Have the characters roll initiative. Any attack or spell that hits Strad passes through, revealing that he is only an illusion. On initiative count zero, the illusionary vampire chuckles and melts away like a wax doll in a bonfire, leaving no trace behind, and the glyph disappears. Area K-80, the center stair. If the characters enter this area through the door at the bottom of the stairs, read, The door creaks open to reveal a stone staircase between rough masonry walls. There is little dust on the steps, but a light fog tumbles down the steps from above. If the characters enter this area at the top of the stairs, read, A rough-hewn corridor leads to a stone staircase that descends to the south, flanked by walls of rough masonry and relatively free of dust. These stairs descend before ending at a lonely door. The stairs slope at a 45 degree angle for a distance of 20 feet horizontally, connecting areas K78 and K81. Area K81 the tunnel. This tunnel is cut into the pillar stone of Ravenloft itself. Its surface is slick, and its ceiling is barely six feet high. A lingering fog limits the visibility to a few feet. Characters who have knowledge of stone cutting can tell the passage is a relatively new construction compared to other areas of Ravenloft. The tunnel is 120 feet long, with a stone door at its eastern end. Near the midpoint of the tunnel is a trap door hidden under a layer of fog. Characters can't spot the trap door passively, but an active search accompanied by a successful DC-20 wisdom perception check locates it. Unless the trap door is fastened shut by an iron spike or by some other means, it opens when a hundred pounds of weight or more are pressed on it. When the trap door opens, everyone standing on it slides into the marble chute in area K82. The trapdoor then resets. Area K82, the marble slide. If one or more characters fall through the trapdoor in Area K81, read, You fall into a chute of polished black marble and slide into the darkness. The chute plunges to the trapdoor in Area K81 through a one-way secret door into a flooded cell in Area K74E. Characters who slide all the way to the bottom are deposited in the cell but take no damage. The slide contains no handholds and is too slippery to ascend without the aid of magic. Area K83, the spiral stair. Behind the door lies a dark spiral staircase. The staircase starts at area K78 and climbs to a landing at area K83A and continues upwards to area K37. Area K83A, the spiral stair landing. An extension of area K83, this landing is shown on map 11. This 40 foot long corridor connects two spiral stairways, one leading up and the other descending into the depths of Castle Ravenloft. Hanging from an iron rod bolted to the eastern wall is a dusty 10 foot square tapestry depicting knights on horseback charging across a battlefield under a blood red sky. The lead knight rides a black horse and wears a fur lined black cloak dark grey armour and a visored helm shaped like a wolf's head. His sword glows with the light of the sun. The stairs at the north end of the west wall descends to a door leading to area K78. The stairs at the south end of the wall lead up, ending at a door that opens into area K37. Treasure The tapestry depicts Strahd's father, King Barrel, leading his fearsome knights into a glorious battle. The tapestry weighs 10 pounds and is worth 750 gold pieces intact. 
If it becomes damaged while in the party's possession, it's worthless unless mended. Area K84, the catacombs. Buried deep beneath the keep of Ravenloft lie ancient catacombs with arched ceilings supported by wide hollow columns that double as crypts. Cobwebs hang limp in the musty air. A thick fog clings to the floor which is covered in putrid waste. The black ceiling is moving. The catacombs fill an area roughly 110 feet east to west by 180 feet north to south and the floor is covered in several inches of back guano. The catacombs are made up of 10 foot wide arched walkways running between 10 foot square crypts which serve as pillars that support the 20 foot high ceiling. The area has five means of entries and exit. The door adjacent to Crypt 1, connecting Area K81. A barred archway to the north, connecting with Area K85. A barred archway to the south, connecting Area K86, but warded by teleport traps. A barred archway to the east, connecting with Area K87. The high tower stair, Area K18, or the shaft in Area K18A to the west. Each crypt is sealed with a chiseled stone door, actually a tight-fitting stone slab, measuring three feet wide, five feet tall, and three inches thick. Removing it, or resetting a stone slab, requires an action and a successful DC-15 strength check. Each crypt houses the remains of a person or persons whose epitaph is inscribed on the front of the slab. The crypts are described in the following sections. Their epitaphs noted under the crypt's number in italics. Unless otherwise noted, each crypt contains a 3 foot by 6 foot rectangular bier of marble, 3 feet high, with a skeleton draped in rags lying atop it. The catacombs are home to tens of thousands of bats. The bats hang here during the daytime hours and fly out in the evening through the high tower central shaft in area K18A to hunt at night. They will not attack intruders unless they are provoked, or specifically commanded to do so by Strahd. If one or more bats within a 10 foot square on the map are attacked or caught in the area of a harmful spell, 2d4 swarms of bats form in that area and attack. No more swarms can be formed in that square until the next dawn, while more bats arrive to replenish those that were killed. Teleport Traps Invisible teleport traps are located between Crypts 37 and 38, between Crypt 37 and the wall south of it, and between Crypt 38 and the wall south of it. The traps can't be perceived except with a Detect Magic spell, which reveals an aura of Conjuration Magic within the trapped areas. Although the traps can't be disarmed, a successful casting of Dispel Magic at a DC of 16 on a trap suppresses its magic for one minute allowing characters to move safely through its area. A trap is also suppressed while wholly or partially in an area of an anti-magic field. These teleport traps form a protective ring around the entrance to Strahd's tomb in area K86. Any creature that enters one of these 10 foot square spaces is instantly teleported away, switching places with one of the whites in Crypt 14. The white materializes in the creature's previous location and attacks any living creature it sees. Crypt 1. The epitaph reads, Herein lie the ones who walk the path of pain and torment. The stone door connects not with a crypt, but with a hewn tunnel of stone in area K81. Crypt 2. The epitaph reads, Artisa de Slop, Court Ceiling Painter. The dome ceiling of this crypt is painted with an image of imps holding bouquets of colourful flowers. A skeleton draped in rags lies atop the marble slab in the centre of the crypt. A wooden box is tucked under one bony hand. The box is unlocked. It contains seven wood-handled paintbrushes and seven small gourds of dried up paint. Crypt 3. Lady Isolde Young. Isolde the Incredible. Purveyor of antiques and imports. A skeleton draped in rags lies atop a marble slab in the centre of the crypt. Piled all around it, covering the floor, are heaps of old baskets, braziers and bundled tapestries, candlesticks, chairs, chests, cooking utensils, cressets, 
curtain rods, decanters, dishes, jugs, lamps, scroll cases, tankards and tinder boxes. None of the junk looks valuable. An old chandelier hangs from this dome ceiling. Characters could spend hours searching the crypt. Though the antiques here might fetch a fair amount of coin, they are hardly worth the trouble to transport. Crypt 4 The epitaph reads, Prince Ariel de Plume, Ariel the Heavy. If characters open the door to this crypt, read, The apparition of a large rotund man forms within the dark crypt, its eyes wild with insanity. Large artificial wings unfold from its back. Prince Ariel was a terrible man who longed to fly. He attached artificial wings and empowered the devices with magic, but the apparatus still couldn't bear his weight, and he plunged from the pillar stone of Ravenloft to his death. His evil ghost attacks the characters on sight. If Ariel succeeds in possessing a character, his host climbs to the high tower in Area K-18 until it reaches the peak in Area K-59, then hurls down the tower's central shaft in Area K-18, screaming, I can fly! the whole way down. Crypt 5 The epitaph reads, Artank Swilolovich, friend and member of the Barovian Wine Distilleries Guild. You are greeted by the faint smell of wine. A skeleton draped in rags lies atop the marble slab in the center of the crypt. Heaped around it, covering the entire floor, are thousands of empty wine bottles. Each bottle's label shows that it is from the Wizard of Wine's winery, and the label names the wine inside, Champagne de la Stomp, Red Dragon Crush, or Purple Great Marsh No. 3. Fortunes of Ravenloft If your card reading reveals that a treasure is here, the Five of Coin, the Guildmaster, it is buried under the wine bottles. A character who searches under the bottles finds the treasure automatically. Crypt 6 the epitaph reads, St. Markovia, dead for all time. The ten-foot square section of floor in front of this crypt is a pressurized plate that releases four poison darts hidden in tiny holes in the north wall, as described in the sample traps from the Dungeon Master's Guide. The trap resets when the weight is lifted and can be triggered a total of four times before its supply of darts is depleted. Poison Dart Trap Mechanical Trap when a creature steps on a hidden pressure plate, poison-tipped darts shoot from a spring-loaded or pressurized tube carefully embedded in the surrounding walls. An area might include multiple pressure plates, each one rigged to its own set of darts. The tiny holes in the wall are obscured by dust and cobwebs, or carefully hidden amid a bas-relief, murals or frescoes that adorn the wall. The DC to spot them is 15 with a successful DC-15 intelligence investigation check. A character can deduce the presence of the pressure plates from variations in the mortar and stone used to create it compared to the surrounding floor. Wedging an iron spike or other object under the pressure plate prevents the trap from activating. Stuffing the holes with cloth or wax prevents the darts contained from launching. The trap activates when more than 20 pounds of weight is placed on the pressure plate, releasing four darts. Each dart makes a ranged attack with the plus 8 bonus against a random target within 10 feet of the pressure plate. Vision is irrelevant for this attack roll. If there are no targets in the area, the darts don't hit anything. A target that is hit takes 2 or 1d4 piercing damage and must succeed on a DC 15 constitution saving throw, taking 11 or 2d10 poison damage on a failed save or half as much on a successful one. If the door to the crypt is open, read, This crypt smells of roses. The remains atop its marble slab have disintegrated, except for one thigh bone. If the characters disturb St. Markovia's remain, add, A ghostly form appears above the dust, so faint you can barely discern more than part of a face. From this apparition comes the faintest of whispers. The vampire must be destroyed. Use me as your weapon. With that, it fades away. Treasure A detect magic spell reveals that the thigh bone radiates an aura of evocation magic. St. Makovia's thigh bone Weapon Mace Rare requires attunement. St. Makovia's thigh bone has the properties of a mace of disruption. 
If it scores one or more hits against a vampire or vampire spawn in the course of a single battle, the thigh bone crumbles to dust once the battle concludes. As a youth, Markovia followed her heart and became a priest of the Morning Lord soon after her 18th birthday. She proved to be a charismatic proselytizer and before the age of 30 had gained a reputation for allowing no evil to stand before her. Markovia had long considered Strahd a mad tyrant, but only after his transformation into a vampire did she dare challenge him. As she rallied her followers and prepared to march on Castle Ravenloft, Strahd sent a group of vampires spawned to her abbey. They confronted Markovia and were destroyed to a one. Suffused with confidence, born of righteous victory, Markovia advanced on Castle Ravenloft. A great battle raged from the catacombs to the parapets. In the end, Markovia never returned to Barovia, and Strahd long afterward walked with a limp and a grimace of pain. It is said that he trapped Markovia in the crypt beneath his castle, and her remains linger there still. The essence of Markovia's saintliness passed partly into her bones as the rest of her body decomposed. Her remaining thigh bone is imbued with the power that inflicts grievous injury on the undead. Mace of Disruption Weapon, Mace, Rare, Requires Attunement When you hit a fiend or an undead with this magic weapon, the creature takes an extra 2d6 radiant damage. If the target has 25 hit points or fewer after taking this damage, it must succeed on a DC 15 wisdom saving throw or be destroyed. On a successful save, the creature becomes frightened of you until the end of your next turn. While you hold this weapon, it sheds bright light in a 20 foot radius and dim light for an additional 20 feet. Crypt 7 The stone door of this crypt lies on the floor its inscription obscured by fog. The crypt gapes open. A skull, some bones, and a few bits of rusted armor lie atop a marble slab, with a leering stone gargoyle squatting at each end. The epitaph to the door reads, Endurovich, Endurovich the Terrible, what the blood of a hundred wars did not do, the spurn of a woman accomplished. Endurovich was a ruthless soldier, and a self-aggrandizing noble who loved a woman named Maria. But she loved another man. As Maria and her lover were dining, Endurovich put poison into the man's wine glass. The glasses were mixed up. Maria drank the poison instead. The lover was hanged for murdering Maria and buried at the Iblis River crossroads as described in Chapter 2, Area F. Endurovich never got over his guilt and, out of madness, killed many in his lifetime. Endurovich's spirit is trapped inside one of the gargoyles. If anyone disturbs the bones on the slab, one of the gargoyles awakens and attacks. If the gargoyle is reduced to zero hit points, Endurovich's spirit moves to the second gargoyle, which then awakens and attacks. Both gargoyles have maximum hit points, 77. Once the second gargoyle is destroyed, Endurovich's spirit is laid to rest. Fortunes of Ravenloft if your card reading reveals that a treasure is here, the one of coins, the swashbuckler, it is contained in a secret compartment under Endurovich's remains. Once his bones and dust are swept away, the compartment can be found and opened without an ability check. Crypt 8. The epitaph reads, Duchess Dauphinia de Silnia. A skeleton draped in rags lies atop the marble slab in the center of the crypt. Hanging on the back wall is a handsome quilt that depicts a royal feast. The quilt is magically preserved, but not valuable. Crypt 9. The epitaph reads, Piddlewick, Fool of Dofnina. A small skeleton wearing the remains of a fool costume lies atop a stumpy marble slab in the center of the crypt. If Piddlewick II from Area K-59 is with the party, it refuses to enter the crypt. The slab in this crypt is four feet long, instead of being the usual six feet. The bones atop the slab belong to the full servant of the Duchess Dauphinia de Silnia, as described in Crypt 8. Treasure If the characters explore the crypt after summoning the ghosts of Piddlewick in Area K-36, they find a small flat wooden box in the marble slab next to Piddlewick's bones. The box contains a full deck of a deck of illusions. Crypt 10 the epitaph reads, Sir Leonid Krushkin, Sir Lee the Crusher, bigger than life, 
He loved his jewellery. An oversized skeleton draped in jewellery and rags lies atop an elongated marble slab in the centre of the crypt. Leaning against the slab is a blood-stained maul strung with cobwebs. Sir Lee stood well over seven feet tall. His maul might give characters pause, but it is harmless and not magical. Treasure. Three jeweled necklaces worth 750 gold pieces each are lying across Sir Lee's skeleton. Crypt 11. The epitaph reads, Tasha Petrovna, healer of kings, light unto the west, servant companion. A skeleton wearing a tattered priestly vestment lies atop a marble slab in the center of the crypt. The dome ceiling overhead is painted with a glorious sun mural. Creatures that would take damage from exposure to sunlight, such as vampires, have disadvantage on all ability checks, attack rolls, and saving throws while inside this crypt. Treasure. Draped around the neck of the skeleton is a sun-shaped holy symbol worth 25 gold pieces. A good aligned character who picks up the holy symbol hears a ghostly female voice, and it whispers the following message. There is a grave to the west, with roses that never die in a place built by healers in the village called Krezek. When all turns to darkness, touch this holy symbol to the grave to summon the light and find a treasure long lost. The message refers to the gravestone in the Abbey of St. Markovia, as described in Chapter 8, Area S7. Crypt 12. The epitaph reads, King Trotsky, the Three-Faced King. There are no bones atop the marble slab in this crypt, only a steel helm with the visor shaped like an angry face. The helm has three evenly spaced visors crafted to look like human faces. One sad, one happy, and one angry. Only the angry visage is visible from the crypt's doorway. King Trotsky wore his three-faced helm in battle, earning him the mockaneer of the three-faced king. The helm is not magical and weighs ten pounds. The slab upon which the helm rests is weight sensitive. If the helm is removed from the slab without 10 pounds of weight immediately being added, poisonous gas pours out of the slab's hollow interior and fills the crypt. A character who searches the slab for traps and succeeds on a DC-12 wisdom perception check spots tiny holes bored into the slab's marble base. It's from these holes that the gas spews forth. A creature in the crypt when the gas is released must make a DC-14 constitution saving throw, taking 22 or 4d10 poison damage on a failed save, or half as much damage on a successful one. Crypt 13. The epitaph reads, King Katsuki, Katsuki the Bright, ruler, inventor, and self-proclaimed time traveler. A skeleton draped in rags lies atop a marble slab in the center of the crypt. Lying amid the bones is a stopper drinking horn, a fat pouch, and a weird-looking scepter made of metal and wood. Above the bones hanging from the dome ceiling by wires is a wooden flying contraption that looks like a set of folded dragon wings fitted with leather straps, metal buckles, and taut leather wing flaps. The stopper drinking horn is a water-resisted powdered horn loaded with gunpowder, and the weird-looking scepter is a musket. The fat pouch contains 20 silver marbles, or silvered bullets for the musket. For more information on the firearms and explosives, see the Dungeon Master's Guide. Glider. Any small or medium humanoid can wear the Dragon Wing Glider. It takes one minute to don or dock the glider. It can't support more than 80 pounds, although the amount of weight it can carry is not evident. A character who inspects the glider with an attempt to discern its maximum weight allowance can do so accurately with a successful DC-15 intelligence check. If its wearer is light enough, accounting for their gear, the apparatus can be used to glide, but only in wide open spaces where there is room to maneuver. The wearer can become airborne by stepping or jumping off a high place, or by performing a high jump to take off from level ground. While aloft, the wearer gains a flying speed equal to its walking speed, with the following limitations. Except for a significant updraft, the wearer can't use the glider to gain altitude, and the glider descends one foot for every ten feet of horizontal distance it is covered. At the end of the flight, the wearer lands on its feet and the glider is intact. 
If the wearer tries to accelerate the rate of descent, the glider breaks and the wearer falls. The glider has AC 12 with one hit point and a 15 foot wingspan. Any damage causes it to break and become inoperable. A mending cantrip can repair the damage, provided all the broken pieces are present. Musket, weapon, firearm, renaissance, martial weapon and arranged weapon. Dealing 1d12 piercing, requiring ammunition, at a range of 40 to 120 feet. It has the loading and two-handed property. Ammunition. You can use a weapon that has an ammunition property to make a ranged attack only if you have ammunition to fire from the weapon. Each time you attack with the weapon, you expend one piece of ammunition, drawing the ammunition from a quiver, case, or other container as part of the attack. Loading a one-handed weapon requires a free hand. The ammunition of a firearm is destroyed upon use. If you use a weapon that has the ammunition property to make a melee attack, you treat the weapon as an improvised weapon. A sling must be loaded to deal any damage when used in this way. Loading. Because of the time required to load this weapon, you can fire only one piece of ammunition from it when you use an action, bonus action, or reaction to fire it, regardless of the number of attacks you can normally make. Two-handed. This weapon requires two hands to use. This property is relevant only when you attack with the weapon, not when you simply hold it. Crypt 14. The epitaph reads, Strabal Indiba, a truer friend no ruler ever had. Here lies his family in honor. If the characters open the door to this crypt, read, A ten-foot square shaft plunges into darkness. The sound of slowly dripping water echoes up the shaft. Characters who have dark vision or a sufficient light source can see that the shaft descends 40 feet to some kind of vault deep in the pillar stone of Ravenloft. Stones protrude from the shaft at regular intervals, offering handholds and footholds. The stones are slippery, however, a character who tries to scale the wall without the aid of magic or the use of the climber's kit must make a successful DC-10 strength athletics check. Vault. When characters reach the bottom of the shaft, read... At the bottom of the shaft is a dank vault with a 10 foot high ceiling. The room is awkwardly shaped and smells of rotten meat. 15 stone coffins are scattered throughout the vault, all orientated with their heads pointed north. The floor is covered with human bones and rusty swords. If a character teleports into a coffin from one of the teleport traps that protects Strahd's tomb in area K86, read the following to that character's player. A flash of light explodes around you, then you are plunged into absolute darkness, suddenly lying in a confined space, choked with dust. This vault contains 15 whites, one per coffin, minus any that had been teleported away, as described in the teleport trap section. Lifting a coffin's lid requires an action and a successful DC-15 strength check. Each white remains inactive until it is teleported away, or until its coffin is open whereupon it attacks. The bones and rusty swords cover the floor to a depth of six inches. These are the remains of the servants who swore to avenge Strabal Indabak's family. Whenever a white is killed in the vault, some of the bones knit together, forming 2d6 animated human skeletons. These skeletons attack intruders on sight, but have no ranged attacks. There are enough bones and swords in the room for 100 skeletons to form in this manner. Crypt 15. The epitaph reads, Kazan, his word was power. A skeleton draped in rags lies atop a marble slab in the centre of the crypt. The skull has black opals set into its eye sockets and shards of amber where its teeth should be. Kazan was a powerful archmage who unlocked the secrets of lichdom, then later tried to become a demilich and failed. Neither his skull nor his bones pose any threat but the gems embedded in the skull are valuable. Treasure. The skull's black opal eye gemstones are worth a thousand gold pieces. The skull also has eight amber teeth worth a hundred gold pieces each. Any creature that stands inside the crypt and boldly speaks the name Kazan causes the pillar stone of Ravenloft to tremble as a staff of power materializes above the marble slab and hovers in place. The first creature to grab hold of it must make a DC-17 constitution saving throw 
taking 44 or 8d10 lightning damage on a failed save, or half as much on a success. Afterward, the Staff of Power can be held and used normally. If no one grabs the Staff within one round of its appearance, it vanishes never to return. Crypt 16. The epitaph reads, Elsa Falona von Twitterberg, beloved actor. She had many followers. A skeleton draped in rags lies atop a marble slab in the center of the crypt. Nine shallow alcoves are carved into the surrounding walls. The back wall of each alcove is painted with a full body image of a handsome man. Some of the men wear fine clothes, others wear armor. At the feet of each painting rests a skull atop a pile of bones. The bones in the niches belong to Elsa's nine consorts. There is nothing of value here. Crypt 17. The epitaph reads, Sir Sidric Spinwitovich, Admiral Spinwitovich. Confused though he was, he built the greatest naval force ever assembled in a landlocked country. An 11 foot long funeral barge dominates this crypt, wedged diagonally into the available space. Lying in the boat is a skeleton draped in rags, with hundreds of gold coins piled around it. The coins are made of clay painted gold and are worthless. The funeral barge which was assembled inside the crypt is too big to fit through the door. Crypt 18 The stone door of this crypt has been carefully laid to one side. Through the swirly mists of perpetual fog, freshly engraved letters spell out the words, Irina Koliana, wife. The crypt is empty and has been swept clean. This is where Strahd intends to keep Irina once he turns her into a vampire spawn. Crypt 19 the epitaph reads, Artemis, builder of the keep, thou standest amidst the monument to his life. A skeleton draped in rags lies atop a marble slab in the center of the crypt. This crypt contains nothing of interest. Crypt 20. The epitaph reads, Sasha Eliskova, wife. Webs as thick and pale as linen cover a sharply female form lying atop a marble slab in the center of this dusty web-filled crypt. You hear a voice issue from the darkness. My love, have you come to set me free? The woman rises, the shroud of webs cling to her in a ghastly fashion. This vampire spawn is an old wife of Strad's. Once she realizes that the characters aren't her husband, Sasha tears away her web shroud like an unloved wedding dress and attacks. Crypt 21. The epitaph reads, Petrina Velikovna, Bride. The creature inside the crypt attacks as soon as the door opens. From the darkness comes a horrific visage, a spectral elf maiden twisted by the horror of her undead existence. She wails and every sound claws at your soul. The spectral elf is a banshee that attacks the characters on sight using her wail immediately. Once awakened, the Banshee is free to roam Castle Ravenloft, but she can't travel more than five miles from this crypt. In life, Petrina Velikovna was a Dusk Elf who, having learned a great deal about the Black Arts, was nearly matched for Strahd's power. She felt a great bond with him, and asked to solemnize that bond in a dark marriage. Drawn to her knowledge and power, Strahd consented, but before he could drain all the life from Petrina, her own people stoned her to death in an act of mercy to thwart Strahd's plans. Strahd demanded and got Petrina's body. She then became the Banshee trapped here. Reducing the Banshee to zero hit points causes it to discorporate. Petrina's spirit can't rest, however. Until she is formally wed to Strahd, the Banshee reforms in a crypt 24 hours later. Casting a hollow spell on the crypt, prevents the Banshee from returning as long as the spell lasts. Petrina's crypt contains 250 platinum pieces, 1,100 gold pieces, 2,300 electrum pieces, 5,200 silver pieces, and 8,000 copper pieces. The coins are of a mixed origin. The platinum and electrum coins have Strahd's profiled visage stamped on them. Buried under these coins is Petrina's spellbook, which has a carved wooden cover. It contains all the spells listed for the Archmage in the Monster Manual. Development If she is restored to life by her brother, as described in Kazmir's Dark Gifts, 
Petrina, the neutral evil female Dusk Elf, returns as an Archmage with no spells prepared. If the characters have her spellbook, she kindly asks them to give it back to her so that she can prepare her long-forgotten spells and help destroy Strahd. A lie. If the characters oblige, she repays their kindness by learning as much about them as possible before pursuing her own goals. Crypt 22 The epitaph reads, Sir Eric von der Bucks, a gilded man lies atop a marbled slab in the centre of this otherwise barren crypt. Sir Eric von der Bucks was a wealthy noble whose dying wish was to have his corpse dipped in molten gold. Treasure the thin layer of gold, if peeled from Sir Eric's desiccated corpse, is worth 500 gold pieces. Crypt 23 The first time the characters happen upon this crypt, they see one of their names, determined randomly, etched onto the door. Opening the crypt releases a horrible stench of decay and reveals a corpse lying on the marble slab within. The corpse looks like the character named on the door. Touching the corpse causes it to melt away whereupon the inscription fades. On later visits to this crypt, the door is unmarked and the crypt is empty. Crypt 24 Champion of the Winter Dog Racing The race may go to the swift, but vengeance is for the loser's relatives. A skeleton draped in bits of fur lies atop a marble slab in the centre of the crypt. The walls and ceilings are covered with plaster paint, to make the crypt seem as if it stands in an evergreen forest surrounded by snow. The plaster has peeled and fallen away in many places, shattering the illusion. This crypt contains nothing of interest. Crypt 25 Stefan Gregorovich First Counselor to King Baron von Zarovich A skeleton draped in rags lies atop a marble slab in the centre of the crypt. Most of the bones appear dusty and neglected, but the skull is well polished. A detect magic spell cast here reveals that Stefan's skull radiates a faint aura of necromancy magic. As long as the skull remains in the crypt, it will answer up to five questions put to it, as though a speak with dead spell has been cast on it. This property recharges each day at dawn. In life, Stefan was neither observant nor well informed. If the skull is questioned about Strahd or Castle Ravenloft, the information it provides is untrue. Crypt 26. The epitaph reads, Intri Silk Valu, he spurned wealth for the knowledge he could take to heaven. A skeleton draped in rags lies atop a marble slab in the centre of the crypt. Most of the bones appear dusty and neglected, but the skull is well polished. A detect magic spell cast here reveals that Intri's skull radiates a faint aura of necromancy magic. As long as the skull remains in the crypt, it will answer up to five questions put to it, as though a speak with dead spell has been cast on it. This property recharges each day at dawn. Unlike Stefan Grigorovich in Crypt 25, Intri was well educated and astute. If the skull is questioned about Strahd or the castle, the information it provides is true. Crypt 27 This crypt is missing its door. Three giant wolf spiders infest this otherwise empty crypt. The spiders make no noise and leap out to attack anyone who moves in front of the crypt's gaping doorway. Crypt 28 The epitaph reads, Pascal Offenheis, Chef Deluxe. A skeleton draped in white linen lies atop a marble slab in the centre of the crypt, clutching a bell in its sunken chest. Fitted over its skull is a tall chef's hat. If the bell is rung inside the crypt, Magic fire sweeps through the crypt to scorch Chef Offenheis's bones. A creature in the crypt must make a DC-17 dexterity saving throw, taking 22 or 4d10 fire damage on a failed save, or half as much on a successful one. Any creature that fails its save catches fire, taking 5 or 1d10 fire damage at the end of each of its turns, until it or another creature uses an action to douse the flames. Treasure. Tucked under the chef's hat is an electrum spork with a bejeweled handle, worth 250 gold pieces. Crypt 29. The epitaph reads, Baron is Glez Druf. Opening the door causes the air around you to turn as cold as the coldest hell you can imagine. Every surface inside the crypt 
is covered with thick brownish mould. A patch of brown mould, as described in the Dungeon Master's Guide, fills the crypt. Characters within five feet of the crypt's open doorway are affected. If the brown mould is killed off, characters can dig through the mouldy crust to find the bones of Baron Druif lying atop a marble slab. Treasure Hidden under the brown mould next to the Baron's bones is a luck blade with one wish remaining. If a creature uses the wish to try to escape from Barovia, the spell fails. If a creature uses the sword to wish for Strahd's destruction, the wish doesn't destroy Strahd, but rather teleports him within five feet of the sword. Crypt 30. The epitaph reads, Prefix Cyril Romulich, beloved by King Barov and Queen Ravnovia, High Priest of the Most Holy Order. A marble slab in the centre of the crypt displays a skeleton draped in red vestments, a holy symbol clutched in one bony hand. The dome ceiling 15 feet above is painted to look like a canopy of trees with bright autumn leaves. A narrow stone ledge encircles the crypt 10 feet above the floor. Perched on it are a dozen stone ravens, their eyes fixed on the marble slab. The carved ravens are ominous, yet harmless. Treasure The prefect's gold holy symbol is festooned with tiny gemstones and is worth 750 gold pieces. If touched by an evil creature, the holy symbol is consumed in a blast of intense light that deals 11 or 2d10 radiant damage to all creatures within 5 feet of it. Characters familiar with Barovian religion recognize the symbol as that of the Morning Lord. Crypt 31 the epitaph reads, We knew him only by his wealth. This crypt is empty. Its walls are painted to depict mountains of gold coins. The floor of the crypt is actually a cover of a 30-foot deep spiked pit. The cover opens if a 100 pounds of weight or more are placed on it. It splits down the middle, east to west, and its doors are spring-loaded. After a victim or victims fall into the pit, the doors snap shut as locking pits and spiked pits are described in the Dungeon Master's Guide. The spikes at the bottom of the pit are made out of iron, but aren't poisoned. Pits. Mechanical Trap. Locking Pit. This pit trap is identical to a hidden pit trap, with one key exception. The trap door that covers the pit is spring-loaded. After a creature falls into the pit, the cover snaps shut to trap the victim inside. A successful DC-20 strength check is necessary to pry the cover open. The cover can also be smashed open. A character in the pit can also attempt to disable the spring mechanism from inside with a DC-15 dexterity check using thieves tools, provided that the mechanism can be reached and the character can see. In some cases, a mechanism, usually hidden behind a secret door nearby, opens the pit. Spiked Pit This pit trap is a simple, hidden or locking trap with sharpened wooden or iron spikes at the bottom. A creature falling into the pit takes 11 or 2d10 piercing damage from the spikes, in addition to any fall damage. Even nastier versions have poison smeared on the spikes. In that case, anyone taking piercing damage from the spikes must also make a DC 13 constitution saving throw, taking 22 or 4d10 poison damage on a failed save or half as much on a successful one. Treasure A human skeleton, the remains of a dead adventurer, wrapped in bits of studded leather armour, lies amid the spikes at the bottom of the pit. A shattered lantern and a rusty crowbar lie nearby. Tied to the corpse's leather belt is a 50-foot coil of hemp and rope, a dagger in a worn scabbard, a pouch containing 25 platinum pieces, and a stoppered wooden tube containing a spell scroll of magic circle. Fortunes of Ravenloft If your card reading reveals that a treasure is here, the Four of Swords, the mercenary, it is lying next to the skeleton at the bottom of the pit. Crypt 32 The door to this crypt has no name or epitaph on it. This crypt is empty except for two alcoves at the back wall. Above these alcoves are carved the following words. Pass not these portals, ye foolish mortals. A detect magic spell reveals both alcoves radiate strong auras of conjuration magic. 
creatures that enter the eastern alcove of this crypt are teleported to the eastern alcove of Strahd's tomb in area K86. Stepping onto the western alcove of this crypt has no effect, but any creature that teleports from the western alcove of area K86 appears here. Crypt 33. The epitaph reads, Sir Klutz Tripolotsky, he fell on his own sword. In the center of this crypt, atop a marble slab, human bones lie amid the empty shell of a suit of rusty plate armor. Plunged through the armor's breastplate is a longsword. Neither Sir Klutz's armor nor his longsword are magical or valuable. If the sword is pulled out of the armor, Sir Klutz appears as a phantom warrior, thanks whoever pulled his weapon free, and agrees to fight alongside that character for the next seven days. Sir Klutz perished years before Strahd became a vampire, so the Phantom Warrior knows nothing of Strahd's downfall, or the curse afflicting Barovia. Crypt 34 King Drosten of the Hellborn Resting in the center of this crypt is a seven-foot-long gilded sarcophagus, its lid painted with the likeness of a screaming king wearing a crown of thorns. Looming behind the sarcophagus is a stuffed owlbear, frozen in a roar with claws outstretched. King Drosden was an ancient ruler of this land, long before the arrival of Strahd. He claimed to be a descendant from the Duke of the Nine Hells, and his deeds did justice to this ancestry. His sarcophagus is made of beaten lead and encased in gold. Its lid can be pried open with a crowbar or similar tool, revealing nothing but dust within. The stuffed owlbear is a late addition to the crypt's decor, a gift given to Strahd that wound up in here. It looks almost alive, but is harmless. An invisible imp is perched atop the owlbear. If someone tries to open the sarcophagus, the imp says in common, I wouldn't do that if I were you. The imp is magically bound to King Drosten's remains and must watch over them for several more centuries before its contract is fulfilled. It isn't obligated to protect the contents of the crypt, so it will not attack and it delights in telling lies and engaging in mischief. For instance, it warns the characters that the sarcophagus is trapped, and that opening the lid will free a pit fiend bound within. Treasure Characters who take the time to pry the gold from the sarcophagus can amass 500 gold pieces worth of precious metal, weighing 10 pounds. Crypt 35 The epitaph reads, Sir John Ward the Trickster the joke was on him. A charnel stench fills this empty crypt. The floor here is an illusion that hides a 20 foot deep pit. The sides of the pit are polished smooth. A creature without a climbing speed can't move along them without the aid of magic or a climber's kit. At the bottom of the pit are six starving ghouls. A permanent silence spell suppresses sound in the pit. The silence can be dispelled, as can the illusionary four with a DC-14 check for both. Treasure Sir Jarnwald was entombed here, so far as he was pushed into the crypt and devoured by ghouls. What remains of him lies scattered on the pit floor, a few scraps of clothing, a handful of teeth, and a signet ring that bears a stylized J worth 25 gold pieces. Crypt 36 Floor marks obliterate the name of this crypt's door. A skeleton draped in rags lies atop a marble slab in the center of the crypt. This crypt contains nothing of interest. Crypt 37. The epitaph reads, Gralmore Nipplenobs, Wizard Extraordinaire. Lying on a marble slab in the center of this crypt is the corpse of a man with a long white beard. His skin clings tightly to his skull and bones. He wears dusty red robes. Clutching to his chest is a wooden staff that has a brass knob on one end and a marble knob on the other. The staff is a non-magical quarterstaff. Inspection of the marble slab reveals a shallow concave recess at one end. If the marble knobbed end of the Gralmore's staff is placed in the recess, the slab levitates five feet upwards, revealing a compartment underneath. The slab slowly slinks back down after one minute. If the brass knobbed end of the staff is placed in the recess, the holder of the staff takes 22 or 4d10 lightning damage. Treasure. The compartment under the slab holds a small black leather case containing three spell scrolls, 
a cone of cold, fireball, and lightning bolt. Fortunes of Ravenloft. If your card reading reveals that a treasure is here, the Six of Stars, the Evoker, it is in the compartment with the other treasure. Crypt 38. The epitaph reads, General Crovel Mad Dog Grizzlek, Master of the Hunt, a leader of hounds and men. When the characters open the doors to this crypt, read, The stench of brimstone and burnt furs spills from this crypt. In its darkness are three pairs of glowing red eyes. Three hellhounds lunge forth and attack, fighting to the death. In the round after they attack, General Grizzlick's wraith emerges from the crypt, uttering commands to the hellhounds in Infernal. Once these evil creatures are slain, the characters can inspect the crypt more closely. Bits of incinerated bone lie strewn atop a marble slab in the center of the crypt. Lying amid the bones are fragments of a shattered spear with a silvered head. The walls and dome ceiling of the crypt are covered with scorched murals that depict legions of infantry and cavalry clashing on the battlefields. A mending cantrip can repair the spear, which is broken into three pieces of roughly equal length. If repaired, it can be wielded as a silvered non-magical spear. Fortunes of Ravenloft If your card reading reveals that a treasure is here, the Six of Swords, the Berserker, it is in a secret compartment under Grizzlick's remains. Once his charred bones are cleared away, the compartment can be found and opened without an ability check. Crypt 39 The epitaph reads, Bucephalus, the Wonder Horse. May the flowers grow ever brighter wherever he trods. The door to this crypt is larger than all the other doors, six feet wide and eight feet tall. Removing or resetting the slab requires a DC 20 strength check. When the door is opened, read, Dry hot air and smoke billow from the crypt as a black horse with a flaming mane and fiery hooves emerges. Smoke billows from its nostrils as it rears up to attack. The nightmare Bucephalus is Strahd Steed. It has 104 hit points. If the characters slay it, Strahd hunts them down mercilessly. When the steed wants to leave the castle, it flies up the central shaft of the high tower in area K18A, exiting through the gash in the tower roof in area K59. Crypt 40 Tassel Eris, Last of the Line a skeleton draped in rags lies atop a marble slab in the center of the crypt. Mounted on the north, east, and south walls are three unlit torches in iron brackets. When a creature enters this tomb for the first time, the torches burst into flames and continue to burn until they are spent or extinguished. Examination of the skull and bones reveal that they are plaster facsimiles. Area K85 Sergis Tomb a portcullis is closed in the archway into this tomb. Lifting it requires a successful DC 25 strength check. White marble steps descend to a tomb that has a vaulted 30-foot ceiling overhead. A stillness, a calm amid the storm is felt here. In the center of the tomb, a white marble slab supports an intricately inlaid coffin. Chiseled into the slab is a name. Sergei von Zarevich. To the north, behind the coffin, are three alcoves. A beautifully carved statue stands in each alcove. A stunning young man flanked by two angels, looking as polished and new as the day they were placed here. An iron lever protrudes from the south wall, west of the tomb's entrance. Raising the lever lifts the portcullis at the top of the stairs. Pulling it down lowers the portcullis. The coffin opens easily to the touch of a lawful good creature, otherwise opening it requires a successful DC 15 strength check. Sergi's flesh has been magically preserved, and at first glance it looks like he is sleeping in his casket. Treasure Sergi's embalmed body is clothed in a shining plus two plate armor. Fortunes of Ravenloft If your card reading reveals that a treasure is here, the two of swords the paladin. It is inside the coffin next to Sergi's body. If your card reading indicates an encounter with Strahd in this area, the Broken One, the King of Diamonds, or 
the innocent, the Queen of Hearts. He is lying across Sergi's coffin, weeping. Area K-86, Strahd's tomb. A heavy portcullis stands closed in the archway leading to this tomb. Lifting it requires a successful DC-25 strength check. Black marble steps descend into a dark tomb that has a vaulted ceiling 30 feet overhead. The essence of evil permeates the very air. The smell of freshly turned earth is here. Settled into the dirt on the floor is a shining black coffin of finely waxed wood. The coffin's fittings are of brilliant brass and the lid closed. South of the coffin are three gloomy alcoves. An iron lever protrudes from the north wall, east of the tomb's entrance. Raising the lever lifts the portcullis at the top of the stairs. Pulling it down lowers the portcullis. Lying under the earth near the east wall of the tomb are three vampire spawn brides dressed in soiled gowns, wearing dirt encrusted jewellery. They rise to attack anyone who approaches Strahd's coffin. A detect magic spell reveals that the western and eastern alcoves radiate strong auras of conjuration magic. The central alcove is non-magical. Creatures that enter the western alcove are instantly teleported to the western alcove of Crypt 32 in area K84. Stepping into the eastern alcove has no effect, but any creature that teleports from the eastern alcove of Crypt 32 appears here. Treasure Strahd lavished many fine gifts on his three brides. Ludmilla Vesivik wears a soiled white wedding gown, a gold tiara worth 750 gold pieces, and 10 gold bracelets worth 100 gold pieces each. Anna Streya Kareleva wears a stained and tattered red wedding gown, a black and crimson silk headscarf sewn with precious jewels worth 750 gold pieces and a platinum necklace with a black opal pendant, worth 1,500 gold pieces. Volenta Popovsky wears a faded gold wedding gown, a platinum mask shaped vaguely like a skull, worth 750 gold pieces, and 10 platinum rings set with gemstones, worth 250 gold pieces each. Teleport Destination Characters who teleport to this location from Area K-78 arrive at the bottom of the stairs just inside the tomb. If your card reading reveals that a treasure is here, the Master of Swords, the Warrior, it lies in the center alcove. If your card reading indicates an encounter with Strahd in this area, the Dark Lord, the King of Spades, or the Horseman, the Second Joker, he is in his coffin, ready to attack anyone who opens the lid. Area K87 the Guardians. The following text assumes that the characters are approaching from Area K-84. If they approach this area from Area K-88, references to descending stairs should be changed to ascending stairs. Wide steps descend to a landing, flanked by two alcoves. Within each alcove, taking up the full 30-foot height of the ceiling, is a bronze statue of a warrior holding a spear. A soft curtain of light flows between the two alcoves, dimly visible on the other side of the curtain are more descending stairs. The curtain has no effect on creatures that move east to west from area K-88 to area K-84. A creature of lawful good alignment that moves west to east through the curtain can do so without difficulty, but creatures of other alignments that do so are teleported back to the top of the stairs behind them. A small creature can squeeze behind and around one of the bronze statues to circumvent the light curtain. Area K-88 The Tomb of King Barov and Queen Ravnovia This tomb rests in hushed silence. Tall stained glass windows dominate the eastern walls, allowing dim light to fall on two coffins resting atop white marble slabs. The one against the north wall is marked King Barov von Zarovich and the one against the south wall is marked Queen Ravnovia Van Rowan. The vaulted ceiling 30 feet overhead is inlaid with beautiful gold mosaic. The stained glass windows are so dirty on the outside as to nearly be opaque. The windows don't open, but they can be smashed easily. Anyone who looks upwards through the window 
can see 110 feet above, the castle stone overlook, area K6. Anyone who falls out a window here plummets almost 900 feet to the base of the pillar stone of Ravenloft. Prying the gold from the ceiling of this tomb would be a long and tedious effort for little reward. The North Coffin holds a beautifully sculpted, life-size wax effigy of Strahd's father, King Barol. The old king's bones lie in a compartment beneath his effigy. The South Coffin holds a skeleton of Strahd's mother, Queen Ravnovia. The magic that was meant to preserve her earthly remains failed years ago. A tattered white shroud covers her bones. Fortunes of Ravenloft If your card reading reveals that a treasure is here, the Four of Glyphs, the Shepherd, it lies atop Queen Ravnovia's coffin. If your card reading indicates an encounter with Strahd in this area, Ghost, the King of Hearts, or Raven, the Queen of Clubs, he is in a frenzy of rage and despair. The final encounter with Strahd von Zarovich. With his mind sharp and his heart dark, Strahd von Zarovich is a formidable foe. Courage and lives beyond measure have been lost to him. Although Strahd can be encountered almost anywhere in his domain, the vampire is always encountered in the place indicated by the Fortunes of Ravenloft card reading, unless he has been forced into his tomb in the catacombs of Castle Ravenloft. Strahd's Tactics Because the entire adventure revolves around Strahd, you must play him intelligently and do everything you can to make him a terrifying and cunning adversary for the player characters. When you run an encounter with Strahd, keep the following facts in mind. Strahd attacks at the most advantageous moment and from the most advantageous position. Strahd knows when he's in over his head. If he begins taking more damage than he can regenerate, he moves beyond the reach of melee combatants and spellcasters, or he flies away using his summoned wolves or a swarm of bats or rats to guard his retreat. Strahd observes the characters to see who among them is the most easily swayed. He then tries to charm the characters who have the lowest wisdom scores and use them as thralls. At the very least, he can order a charm character to guard him against other members of the adventuring party. The Vampire's Minions Whenever Strahd appears in a location other than his tomb, or the place indicated by the Fortunes of Ravenloft card reading. Roll a d20 and consult Strahd's minion table to determine what creatures he brings with him, if any. On a roll of 1 to 3, he brings 1d4 plus 2 direwolves. On a roll of 4 to 6, he brings 1d6 plus 3 ghouls. On a roll of 7 to 9, he brings 1d4 plus 2 Strahd zombies. On a roll of 10 to 12, he brings 2d4 swarms of bats. On a 13 to 15, he brings 1d4 plus 1 vampire spawn. On a roll of 16 to 18, he brings 3d6 wolves. And on a roll of 19 to 20, he doesn't bring anything. If the characters are in a residence, Strahd's creatures break through doors and windows to reach them, or crawl up through the earth or swoop down the chimney. Any vampire spawn, which are all that's left of an adventuring party that Strahd defeated a long time ago, can't enter the character's location unless invited. The Heart of Sorrow Strahd can afford to be bold in his tactics, for he has additional protection in the form of a giant crystal heart hidden inside Castle Ravenloft. Any damage that Strahd takes is transferred to the Heart of Sorrow, as described in Chapter 4, Area K20. If the heart absorbs damage that reduces it to zero hit points, it is destroyed, and Strahd takes any leftover damage. The Heart of Sorrow has 50 hit points, and is restored to that number of hit points each dawn, provided it has at least one hit point remaining. Strahd can, as a bonus action on his turn, break his link to the Heart of Sorrow so that it can no longer absorb damage dealt to him. Strahd can re-establish this link to the Heart of Sorrow as a bonus action on his turn, but only while in Castle Ravenloft. The effect of the protection afforded by the Heart of Strahd can be chilling to behold, as damage to Strahd is quickly undone. For example, a critical hit might dislocate Strahd's jaw, but only for a moment. Then the vampire's jaw quickly resets itself. 
the ability of the heart of sorrow to absorb damage is suppressed if Strahd is fully within an anti-magic field. Lair Actions While Strahd is in Castle Ravenloft, he can take actions as long as he isn't incapacitated. On initiative count 20, losing initiative ties, Strahd can take one of the following lair action options, or forgo using any of them for that round. Until initiative count 20 on the next round, Strahd can pass through solid walls, doors, ceilings and floors as if they weren't there. Strahd targets any number of doors or windows that he can see, causing each one to either open or close as he wishes. Closed doors can be magically locked, needing a DC 20 strength check to force open, until Strahd chooses to end the effect or Strahd uses this lair action again. Strahd summons the angry spirit of one who has died in the castle. The apparition appears next to a hostile creature that Strahd can see, makes an attack against that creature, and then disappears. The apparition has the statistics of a spectre. Strahd targets one medium or smaller creature that casts a shadow. The target's shadow must be visible to Strahd and be within 30 feet of him. If the target fails a DC 17 charisma saving throw, its shadow detaches from it and becomes a shadow that obeys Strahd's commands, acting on initiative count 20. A greater restoration spell or remove curse spell cast on the target restores its natural shadow, but only if its undead shadow has been destroyed. Strahd is a 9th level spellcaster and he has the following wizard spells prepared. His cantrips are Mage Hand, Prestidigitation and Ray of Frost. His first level spells with 4 slots are Comprehend Languages, Fog Cloud and Sleep. His second level spells with 3 slots are Detect Thoughts, Gust of Wind and Mirror Image. His third level spells with 3 slots are Animate Dead, Fireball and Non-Detection. His fourth level spells with three slots are Blight, Greater Invisibility and Polymorph. His fifth level spells with one slot are Animate Objects or Scrying. The following items are items recovered from their Fortunes of Ravenloft card reading. These items are extremely important for any party of adventurers looking to go up against Strahd in combat. The Holy Symbol of Ravenkind a wondrous item, legendary, requires attunement by a cleric or paladin of good alignment. The holy symbol of Ravenkind is a unique holy symbol sacred to the good-hearted faithful of Barovia. It predates the establishment of any church in Barovia. According to legend, it was delivered to a paladin named Lugdana by a giant raven, or an angel in the form of a giant raven. Lugdana used the holy symbol to root out and destroy nests of vampires until her death. The high priest of Ravenloft kept it and wore it as a holy symbol after Lugdana's passing. The holy symbol is a platinum amulet shaped like a sun with a large crystal embedded in its center. The holy symbol has 10 charges for the following properties. It regains 1d6 plus 4 charges daily at dawn. Hold Vampires as an action, you can expend one charge and present the holy symbol to make it flare with holy power. Vampires and vampires spawn within 30 feet of the holy symbol when it flares must make a DC 15 wisdom saving throw. On a failed save, the target is paralyzed for one minute. It can repeat the saving throw at the end of each of its turns to end the effect on itself. Turn Undead If you have the Turn Undead or Turn the Unholy feature, you can expend three charges when you present the holy symbol while using that feature. When you do so, undead have disadvantage on their saving throws against the effect. Sunlight. As an action, you can expend five charges while presenting the holy symbol to make it shed bright light in a 30 foot radius and dim light for an additional 30 feet. The light is sunlight and it lasts for 10 minutes or until you end the effect with no action required. The Sun Sword. Weapon, Longsword, Legendary, requires attunement. The Sun Sword is a unique blade once possessed by Strahd's brother, Sergei von Zadovich. In its original form, it had a platinum hilt and guard, and a thin crystal blade as strong as steel. Strahd employed a powerful wizard named Kazan to destroy the weapon after Sergei's death. The first part of the process required the hilt and blade to be separated, which Kazan accomplished. 
While Kazan was busying himself destroying the blade, his apprentice stole the hilt and fled. Kazan later located his apprentice's mutilated corpse in the Sullivich woods, but the hilt was nowhere to be found. To avoid the vampire's wrath, Kazan told Strahd that the entire weapon had been destroyed. The hilt, which is sentient, knows that it can never be reunited with its original crystal blade. It has, however, gained the properties of a sun blade. Sentience. The sun sword is a sentient chaotic good weapon with an intelligence of 11 and wisdom of 17 and a charisma of 16. It has hearing and normal vision out to a range of 60 feet. The weapon communicates by transmitting emotions to the creature carrying or wielding it. Personality. The Sun Sword's special purpose is to destroy Strahd. Not so much because it wants to free the land of Barovia from evil, but because it wants revenge for the loss of its crystal blade. The weapon secretly fears its own destruction. The Tome of Strahd. The Tome of Strahd is an ancient work penned by Strahd, a tragic tale of how he came to his fallen state. The book is bound in a thick cover with a steel hinge and fastenings. The pages are of parchment and very brittle. Most of the book is written in a curious shorthand that only Strahd employs. Stains and age have made the work mostly illegible, but several paragraphs remain intact and readable. If the characters acquire the Tome of Strahd and want to read these paragraphs, show the players the Tome of Strahd handout as described in the appendix. If Strahd sees, or learns from a minion, that the tome has fallen into the party's possession, all of his other objectives are put on hold until the book is recovered. When Strahd attacks, his preferred target is whoever has the tome. I am the Ancient. I am the Land. My beginnings are lost in the darkness of the past. I was a warrior. I was good and just. I thundered across the land like the wrath of a just god, but the war years and the killing years wore down my soul as the wind wears down stone into sand. All goodness slipped from my life. I found my youth and strength gone, and all that I had left was death. My army settled in the valley of Barovia and took power over the people of the name of a just god, but with none of the god's grace or justice. I called for my family, long unseated from their ancient thrones, and brought them here to settle in the castle Ravenloft. They came with a younger brother of mine, Sergi. He was handsome and youthful. I hated him for both. From the families of the valley, one spirit shone above all others, a rare beauty who was called perfection, joy, and treasure. Her name was Tatiana and I longed for her to be mine. I loved her with all of my heart. I loved her for her youth. I loved her for her joy. But she spurned me. Old One was my name to her. Elder and brother also. Her heart went to Sergi. They were betrothed. The date was set. With the word she called me brother, but when I looked into her eyes, they reflected another name. Death. It was the death of the age that she saw in me. She loved her youth and enjoyed it, but I had squandered mine. The death she saw in me turned her from me, and so I came to hate death. My death. My hate is very strong. I would not be called death so soon. I made a pact with death, a pact of blood. On the day of the wedding, I killed Sergi, my brother. My pact was sealed with his blood. I found Tatiana weeping in the garden east of the chapel. She fled from me. She would not let me explain, and the great anger swelled within me. She had to understand the pact I made for her. I pursued her. Finally, in despair, she flung herself from the walls of Ravenloft. I watched as everything I ever wanted fell from my grasp forever. It was a thousand feet through the mists. No trace of her was ever found. Not even did I know her final fate. Arrows from the castle guard pierced my soul, but I did not die, nor did I live. I became undead forever. I have studied much since then. Vampire is my new name. I still lust for life and youth. 
and I curse the living that took them from me. Even the sun is against me. It is the sun and its light I fear the most, but little else can harm me now. Even a stake through my heart does not kill me, though it does hold me for a moment. But the sword, that cursed sword Sergi brought, I must dispose of that awful tool. I fear it and hate it as much as the sun. I have often hunted for Tatiana. I have even felt her within my grasp. But she escapes. She taunts me. She taunts me. What will it take to bend her to love me? Now that I reside far below Ravenloft, I live among the dead and sleep beneath the very stones of this hollowed castle of despair. I shall seal shut the walls of the stairs so that none may disturb me. Epilogue Strahd is a deadly challenge for the characters. If they confront the vampire too soon, without the benefits of magic items such as the holy symbol of Ravenkind and the Sun Sword, they will likely perish. Characters can improve their chances of survival by exploring the land of Barovia, defeating lesser evils and gaining allies, magic items and levels of experience. The outcome of the final showdown between Strahd and the characters determines how the adventure ends. Strahd prevails. Once he has done toying with the characters, Strahd sets out to defeat them utterly, having concluded that none of them are worthy to replace him as Lord of Barovia. He won't be satisfied until all the characters are dead or turned into his vampire spawn consorts. If Strahd prevails, he seals the characters in the catacombs of Chapter 4, Area K84, Crypt 23, and instructs his servants to hide all their magic items. With the characters out of the way, Strahd shifts his attention back to making Irina Koyana his bride, if she is still alive and within his grasp. Irina is turned into a vampire spawn and sealed in her crypt beneath Castle Ravenloft. When Strahd is reduced to zero hit points, he turns into a mist and retreats to his coffin, as described in the misty escape feature of his vampire stat block. The vampire must be in its resting place to be utterly destroyed. If the characters finish off Strahd in his coffin, read, Strahd can't hide his surprise as death takes him into the black abyss. Surprise turns into rage as the pillar stone of Ravenloft trembles with fury, shaking dust from the ceiling of the vampire's tomb. The shudder abates as Strahd's burning hatred melts away, replaced at last with relief. The dark orbs of his eyes wither and sink into his skull as his corpse deteriorates before you. In a matter of moments, only bones, dust and a noble garb remain. Strahd von Zarevich, the Dark Lord of Barovia, is dead and gone. Rahadan's Revenge If Strahd dies but Rahadan yet lives, the Dusk Elf Chamberlain appears moments after Strahd's demise. When that occurs, read. Master! says a voice from behind you. An elf with dusky brown skin and long black hair, his face a mask of terror, looks on to what you have wrought and screams. Rahadan has served Strahd's family for hundreds of years and doesn't take his master's defeat well. The Dusk Elf Chamberlain draws his scimitar and tries to avenge Strahd. Grief-stricken, he can't be reasoned with. Sergi and Irina. This optional scene can be used after Strahd has been defeated. It assumes that Irina Kolyana survived the adventure and hasn't yet been reunited with Sergi. On the morning after Strahd's demise, the characters feel drawn to Castle Ravenloft's overlook in Area K6, and they witness the following scene. Thick clouds fill the sky. Through the chilly morning mists, the lands of Barovia are visible far below. There is a peacefulness here. Rest has come to the valley for the first time anyone can remember. A light flashes behind you. Wheeling around, you see a stately man, a being of flesh and blood, in shining armour and a flapping cape. His countenance shows great strength of will, yet the forcefulness of his presence is tempered by his calm, sad eyes. His features are of those of Strahd, yet subtly different. His voice is calm and peaceful. My name is Sergei von Zarevich. He turns to Irina. Tatiana, 
the time is at hand to rest. Come, my love and my wife. He stretches forth his hand. Irina Kalyana's questioning eyes suddenly open with recognition and knowledge. Forgotten memories rush back to her. Sergi, she cries, sprinting to him with the grace of a doe. They embrace. Irina turns to you and says, I am Irina Kalyana, but in my past I was Sergi's beloved Tatiana. Through these many centuries we have played out the tragedy of our lives. Now, with our deepest gratitude to you, that tragedy is over. It is time for joy to begin again. Shimmering light surrounds Irina and Sergi. Hand in hand they walk east towards the edge of the overlook. Their feet do not touch the ground as they tread the path beyond this mortal world. Their invisible road takes them beyond the eastern precipice, their glow illuminating and thinning the clouds above Barovia. The clouds suddenly break open, letting shafts of glorious sunlight flood through. In the valley below, the strange fog dissolves. Barovia is free once more. Escape from Barovia Strahd's death grants Barovia a reprieve. The fog that surrounds the land thins and no longer harms those who pass through it. The dark clouds that have loomed over the valley for centuries give way to sunshine, shocking the Barovians out of their despair. The Barovians take the sunlight as a sign that the evil in their land has been purged. Though escape is now possible, most Barovians realize that they have nowhere to go and no reason to leave. A few depart, fearing the return of the darkness, or longing to see their ancestral homelands. Those who have souls can leave the valley, while those without souls fade to nothingness as they take their first steps beyond the edge of Strahd's former domain. Aftermath The bats, wolves and direwolves of Barovia lose their supernatural link to Strahd upon his destruction and become ordinary beasts, destined to be hunted down or driven to the farthest reaches of the Salovich woods. Even after Strahd's death, Castle Ravenloft remains a haunted place shunned by all Barovians. Its dark immensity and threatening countenance are enough to deter locals from plundering or reoccupying it. The Rise of Ismark If he survives the adventure, Ismark Kolyanovich becomes the burgomaster of the village of Barovia. He is grateful to the characters for all they have accomplished and urges them to stay in Barovia and help him rid the land of other threats offering his village as a safe haven. The Vistani Exodus Fearing that the Barovians might kill them for being spies and collaborators, the Vistani pack up their wagons and leave the valley with great haste. The Barovians are happy to see them go. Vampire Hunters If he is still alive, Rudolf van Richten leaves Barovia to live out his remaining days in solitude. His protege, Esmeralda Davnir, isn't convinced that Strahd is truly dead. She knows that there are other evils in Barovia to be conquered, so she elects to remain in the valley. Consorts Unleashed Upon his death, Strahd's vampire spawn are freed from his control, and each seek a new destiny. Escher in particular leaves the realm in search of new experiences and a way to become a vampire lord himself. If Petrina Velikovna lives, she begins plundering arcane knowledge from Castle Ravenloft and the Amber Temple and prepares to become Barovia's new master. Strahd's Return Esmeralda's suspicions prove justified. Strahd's destruction is temporary, for his curse can't so easily be ended. The ancient dark powers with which Strahd forged his pack cause the vampire to reform after a period of months long enough for the Barovians to discover what it feels like to live a life of hope. When Strahd is reborn, the mists surround the land of Barovia once more, and the Barovians' hope turns to horrible despair. Strahd remembers the defeat dealt to him and begins plotting his revenge. After the mists reappear, Madame Eva and her Vistani come back to the valley. The beasts of the land once more fall under Strahd's spell, and the Burgomasters fortify their settlements, hoping against all odds that someone can save them from Strahd again.